Oldham presents... Henry! Henry Aldrich! Coming, Mother! The Aldrich Family, written by Clifford Goldsmith. Entertainment for all the family, brought to you by Postum, a tempting, wholesome drink for all the family. Postum. <laughs> Well, friends, here it is another Thursday night, and opportunity is knocking loudly at your door, and knocking twice. First, it's your opportunity to put away your worries and cares for a half hour, and relax and laugh with those grand people, the Aldrich family. And second, it's your opportunity to find out something about that equally grand mealtime drink, Postum. Why, even in looks, friends, Postum is a winner. The kind of drink you don't waste a second tilting to your lips. It has the kind of flavor you refer to in italics. It has the kind of hearty, robust goodness that warms the cockles of your heart. Now, just don't expect when you try it that Postum is going to taste like coffee any more than you'd expect coffee to taste like tea. Remember that Postum's distinctive flavor is in a class apart. It has an extra special goodness of its own that leaves you no words for description but ah, and ah again. And then, don't be surprised if you enjoy your meals far more than you did before the day you start enjoying Postum. Boys like Penrod Schofield, Tom Sawyer, and Huck Finn live in our memories because they typify the teenage youngsters all of us know. And Henry Aldrich is another of these real American boys. He lives in your block, perhaps in your own home. The scene opens in the Aldrich living room. But, Mary, what have I done? You know very well what you've done, Henry Aldrich. You know very well what you've done. When? Didn't you and Homer ask a whole crowd here to our house for a Valentine party Saturday night? Sure, we even sent out written invitations. But, Henry, that's the night I'm having my party. Mary, how could you have a party? Well, my goodness, Henry, I've been planning on it for six weeks. On a party? Yes, for my sorority. Oh, all right, Mary, can't you meet at some other house? Henry, Mother says it's my party and I can have it here at our house and I'm not to budge an inch. I know, but Mary... Henry, you're wanted on the telephone. Yes, Mother, I'll be there just as soon as I get something straightened out. Mary, how about our invitations? What are Homer and I going to do? I'm sure I don't know. You can have your party at Homer's house. But Mary! But Mary! Hello? Hello, Henry, this is Agnes. Who? Agnes, is Homer there? No, I was just going to call and see whether he's over at your house. There, there's something I have to see him about right away. Well, Henry, we're all looking forward to your party Saturday night. Your? And I was just wondering whether you'd mind calling Lillian Spencer and asking her to come. Lillian Spencer? She'd have an awfully good time, Henry. But, Agnes, I wouldn't. What do you mean by that? Well, besides one reason I'd rather not even mention, I'm not speaking to Lillian. That's all right. I'd be glad to call her. But, Agnes... Agnes, that'll make 13. Henry! Yes, Mary. Just a second, Agnes. Homer's here. Well, tell him to come here quick. Uh, Agnes. Agnes! Oh, gee whiz. Hey, Henry, I was just over to the bakery and ordered four dozen donuts. Homer. Homer, why couldn't we throw the party at your house? Why? Well, your house is a lot nearer the center of town, Homer, and... And your heating system's a lot better than ours. Now, listen, Henry, don't you remember the last party we threw at my house? Oh, Homer, that was just due to an unfortunate series of circumstances. Even so, my father hasn't gotten over it yet. But, Homer, let me tell you. <laughs> we're giving a party Saturday night, and it isn't going to be at your house, and it isn't going to be at mine. <laughs> Mother, why not look at it this way? I'm sorry, dear. Alice, have you seen that piece of paper I had? What was it, Sam? It was a list of the members of the Rotary Club. Father, do you have any ideas as to how we could manage it? Henry, I haven't time to talk about anything. Now I've got to go find that list. But, Mr. Aldrich... Henry, I'm sorry, but you may not have your party here. Please go answer the telephone. Yes, Mother. Henry, what are we going to do? I don't know, Homer. Why do you keep asking me? Because I ordered the donuts in my name. (laughs) Hello? Hello, Henry. This is Kathleen. Oh, hello. I just wanted to tell you the good news. What? Well, I don't suppose I should tell you, but I got a new evening dress for your party. 
You did? An evening... Uh, but, Kathleen, it's going to be informal. Oh, no. Agnes phoned all of us and said it had been changed. We're to wear long dresses. Agnes did? Yes, Henry, and I just wanted to tell you I'm looking forward to coming. Goodbye. But Kathleen! <laughs> Kathleen! What's the matter, Henry? Agnes is having them all dress up. Who gave her any authority like that? You know, Henry, what we've got to do. What? Something about the number 13. Either we've got to get rid of one of our guests or you or I have got to drop out. Now, listen, Homer, you're not going to leave me flat. Well, I was just making a generous offer, Henry. <laughs> I know. Why not call Agnes and see whether she'd have any suggestions? In what way? Well, as long as she's showing so much interest, she might be very glad to have our party at her house. Now, listen, Homer, we're not going to get Agnes any more mixed up in this than she is. Henry, didn't you ever taste the lemon meringue pie her mother makes? Yes. And there you are. Let me call her. But, Homer... Hello. Number, please. Elm 9717. Elm 9717. Homer, how do you know her mother will make any pie? Henry, why worry about that detail when you don't even have a roof over your party? Hello? Hello, is this... Is this Agnes? Yes, Homer, and I'm glad you called. You are? Yes, I want you to go right over to Andy Morton's and get all of his records. What for? For the party Saturday night at Henry's. At Henry's? Yes, aren't you taking me? Well, as a matter of fact, Agnes, that's what I really called you up about. Supposing, supposing it's raining real hard that night. What about it? Well, you wouldn't want to go out in it, would you? I mean, if it was practically the worst storm we've had all season. What made you think of that? You can't tell, Agnes. Suppose it even turned to sleet and froze right on you. Oh, my, I wouldn't go out if it did that. Well, I'm glad you'd be sensible, because I've got a wonderful solution. We're all coming over to your house. What's that? Ask her about the pie, Homer. Homer, the invitation said the party was to be at the Aldrich's. But, Agnes, why not look at it this way? Now, listen, Homer Brown. I wonder why she doesn't come to the door. You know, Homer, something tells me we're going to be sorry we're having the party at Agnes's house. Henry will have a wonderful time, and it was very nice of Agnes. But... But why do we have to come over a day early? Because she said we had to come and make the plan. Sure, that's what I mean. Homer, we know what the inside of our house looks like. Hello. Hi, Agnes. Hello. Come on in. My goodness, I'm so excited. Yeah? First of all, I've got a lot of ideas about things for us to eat. Oh, Agnes, so far as the refreshments are concerned, Homer and I have taken care of everything but... The lemon meringue pie. But, Henry, what are you having? Ginger ale and donuts. Donuts? Sure. We just ordered four dozen. Four dozen? Sure. But, my goodness, four dozen? Well, Agnes, that isn't so many. As a matter of fact, I was just thinking we ought to double the order. Sure. But, boys, I don't like donuts. But I do. All right. My goodness, why worry over a little thing like donuts? Naturally, we can decide a thing like that later on. Now, here's the living room. Oh, yes. Yes. The first thing you want to do is move the piano down to the other end of the room. Move it? Move it. Yes, and you might as well do it now <laughs> while I tell my mother to bake a couple of cakes in case we don't have donuts. What's that? In addition to the lemon meringue? Of course. Oh, gee whiz, Agnes. Naturally, I'd move your piano any place you want it. And so will I. And, and Agnes, are we glad you can come to our party here? Well, thanks, fellas. It was certainly very nice of you to ask me. And would you do me a favor? Sure. Sure. What is it? Would you mind if I asked Gertie Parker to come Saturday night? She doesn't get invited to many parties. Gertie Parker? Gertie Parker? Oh, boy. I'm glad you mentioned her. I'll call her right now. Listen, Homer, who mentioned her? But, Henry, why should you object to Gertie Parker when you're getting a wonderful room like this thrown in with her? Come on, let's move the piano. Okay, but my heart isn't in it. Push. Push yourself. Keep her going. Push. <laughs> Now, wait a second, Henry. Well, that's what I say. Uh, Homer, after we get this taken care of, how about our moving that picture that's on the wall? Well, what's the matter with it? That's Agnes's father. It is? Sure. <laughs> Come on and push. Push yourself. Oh, gee whiz. Boys, may I ask just what you think you're doing? Wait. Uh, hello, Mrs. Lawson. Henry Aldrich, I'd like to ask you again what you're doing. Wait, we're just... We're just and getting ready for the party. What party? Ours. Here. Had you heard? And we want you to know, Mrs. Lawson, we're very grateful. Boys, will you both please leave this house? Yes, ma'am. Uh, without, without, well, she was. And I have a good notion to call both your parents. Oh, you don't have to bother about anything like that. We're going right away, Mrs. Lawson. <laughs> Tell me 
Henry once more. When you called Henry, just what did he say? Agnes, he said he had no desire whatever to discuss the matter. And he said that I tried to boss their whole party? Yes, Agnes, that's exactly what he said. But I don't see why he should blame me, Kathleen, for something my mother did. And I stuck up for you. I told him you didn't mean to be bossy. My goodness, I was never so embarrassed in my life. I'll never be able to face Homer again. I know, but I don't know why Henry should be so mad at me. At least, Kathleen, I did one thing. The minute I realized my mother wouldn't bake anything for them, I called the bakery and doubled their order for donuts. Really? And Kathleen, as a matter of fact, I have an idea. What is it? First, where's your telephone? My goodness, when I get through, Henry and Homer will come around on bended knees and apologize. <laughs> Doesn't she answer? I'm ringing your number. Homer, when you went back to get your hat, what did Mrs. Lawson say? She didn't say anything. She wouldn't even let me in. Well, I can tell you one thing. I'm never going to darken the Lawson door again. And I hope you don't think I'm going to. I'm ringing your number. Thank you. Henry, when you see your mother, tell her I found the list. The what, Father? The list of members of the Rotary Club I was looking for. Hello? Oh, well, she was... Oh, Aunt Harriet, this is Henry. Hello, Henry. What is it you want? I've got to get back to the kitchen. Oh, Aunt Harriet, how would you like to... <clears throat> how would you... Have you got a full day Saturday? No, not especially. Did your mother want me to come over for dinner? Well, if I could arrange it, could you? Well, what did you call me for? Why, uh, I wanted to know whether I could borrow something. What? Your house. What? <laughs> well, Aunt Harriet, I have to give a party that evening, see? And, and gee, if I could arrange it so you wouldn't have to be there, Aunt Harriet, would you be interested? Why, I might. You might? Oh, boy. I'll let you have the party at my house, Henry, provided you don't invite that awful Homer Brown. Who? Oh, what, Aunt Harriet? <laughs> Downstairs, right off the Sunday school room. Well, could you serve a little Valentine's supper tomorrow night? Why, I guess we could. Hey, Miss Henry and Homer have any money. Kathleen, just a minute, Mrs. Tompkins. Kathleen, the food they serve wherever they have it is going to cost something, isn't it? Yes. Then why not let it go toward the church and make it worthwhile? Oh, all right. Hello, Mrs. Tompkins. Hello. Do you suppose you could serve something that wouldn't cost hardly anything? Oh, I guess we could. <laughs> something as simple as a bowl of soup and. Maybe sandwiches and, and a rice pudding. Yes. Well, we're awfully anxious to raise some money for the new organ, and I'm sure the ladies will be more than glad to. Hello? Hello. Is this Miss Harriet Breyer? Yes. Harriet, this is Mrs. Tompkins. Oh, yes. Hello. Say, I've got some good news about the organ. The organ? Yes, the one we're raising money for at the church. Oh. A young lady just phoned and, and wanted to know whether we could have a little dinner for her, a little party tomorrow night. Good. How many are you going to serve? Well, I told her it wouldn't be worth our while unless we had at least 40. Good. And she said she'd see that there were at least that many, and she might be able to round up 50. Well, I'm awfully glad to hear that. That organ we have now bothers me every Sunday. And Harriet, do you suppose you could be one of the ladies that help serve? Tomorrow night? Yes. Oh, I would. I'd be glad to, only I just this minute got through inviting some people over here for a party tomorrow night. Oh? Yes, I'm going to give a little surprise party for my nephew, Henry. I know he wants one. Oh. And I'm asking in quite a few. Mrs. Carbell said she could come if it wasn't too slippery for her bad leg. Really? And another person I'm going to ask is old Mr. Perkins. Oh. Henry will like him. He's a lot of fun at a party. Oh, good. And uh, Miss Fredericks, she hasn't been out all winter. Oh, good. I'm just sorry that you can't be there yourself. Well, I'm afraid Aunt Harriet and Henry have rather different ideas about who's welcome at a teenage boy's party. But something they probably would agree about is what makes the most welcome hot drink at mealtimes. The answer is Postum, of course. Millions of Americans will tell you that. In fact, it's because Postum is so popular, it's because every day more and more people are insisting on Postum that there's a temporary shortage. We just can't keep pace with the fast-growing demand, even though we're making more postum today than ever before in our history. 
So if you can't always immediately get Postum when you ask for it at your grocer's, don't be discouraged. Don't think your grocer isn't going to get any more Postum. He will. And as soon as he does get Postum, you'll get it too. So be sure to ask for it again. Now, getting back to the troubles of Henry Aldrich. Henry and Homer are trying to find a place to hold their party Saturday night. Meanwhile, unknown to them, Agnes Lawson has arranged for them to hold it at the Methodist Church. And Aunt Harriet, also unknown to them, has decided to let them hold it at her house. The scene opens in the Aldrich living room. Henry, will you please answer that phone? Why? Yes, please. Homer, would you mind answering it and just tell whoever it is I'm not here? Henry, I'm not going to be your personal ghost. But... <laughs> but, Homer, suppose it's Agnes trying to get us again. Just tell her again we're not speaking to her. Well, okay. And if it's somebody wanting to know where we're going to have the party, I'll tell them it's slightly up in the air. <laughs> Hello? Hello, is Mr. Aldrich there? Uh, Mr. Aldrich, why, no, he isn't. Oh, well, when he comes in, could you please tell him that the Mansion House phone... The Mansion House? The Mansion House Hotel? Yes, I wanted to submit an estimate for his party Saturday night. A, a party? Yes, I received word that he's planning a party for Saturday night, and I wanted to give him the figures for a private dining room. Well, gee was I- I'm planning a party, but... Oh, are you Mr. Aldrich? Yes, sir, only... Well, only... Oh, you're the gentleman. Yes, sir. Well, I figured out an estimate for you. I know, but we can't afford anything that's going to cost as much as... Well, we just couldn't afford it, that's all. Oh, this isn't going to cost so much. It isn't? No, not at all. How much is it? Well, first, I'll have to know a little more. Uh, would you want a uh, fruit cup or tomato juice to begin with? What's that? <laughs> I said, uh, do you want a fruit cup or tomato juice? Why, Homer, which do you want, a fruit cup or tomato juice? Now, hurry up, I want to get a party. <laughs> at the Mansion House Hotel. Oh, could we have grape juice? Hello, could we have grape juice? Yes, yes, you can have anything you want. We can? Homer, have anything you want. He will. Hurry up and decide. What do you want? I'll take fruit cup. Hello? <laughs> oh, we'll take fruit cup. No, now, wait a minute, Henry. Wait a minute. What's the matter? Make it... Okay, fruit cup. Hello? Fruit cup's okay. Yes, Mr. Aldrich. Uh, now, would you want chicken patties with peas or lamb chops with limas? Well, that sounds all right. Which will it be? What? Chicken patties with peas or lamb chops with limas? Homer, how would you like some lamb chops? All right, with lots of mashed potatoes. Hello? Uh, could we have lamb chops with mashed potatoes? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Aldrich. Lamb chops with mashed potatoes. Lots of them. And uh, how about limas? Mm, no, who wants limas? Gee whiz. Well, now about the dessert. Uh, what would you like? Well, what have you got? Well, we can give you almost any kind of pie, ice cream, French pastry, stewed fruit. Stewed fruit? Listen, Henry, I'm not going to eat any stewed fruit at my own party. <laughs> Hold the line a second. Homer, we can have any dessert we want. Anything? Sure. I've got an idea. Hello? Yes? Could we have pumpkin pie a la mode? That's the old fight, Henry. Well, I guess you could. You'd like it served in separate dishes? No, just dump the whole works together. <laughs> Ask him about chocolate sauce. Oh, yes. Would there be an extra charge? For what? Chocolate sauce. Chocolate sauce? Yes. Are you sure you should have chocolate sauce? Oh, sure. Well, there might be a small charge. Well, how much will the whole thing, including it all, come to? Well, just exactly how many are you having? Why, um, uh, 14 with Gertie Parker. What's that? <laughs> well, I understood it was 200. 200. I don't know where I got the idea, but that was the message that was left here for me. 200? 200 what, Henry? Uh, Mr. Aldrich, I'm afraid that for 14, we'd have to charge you at least a dollar and a half apiece. How much? Now what's happened? <laughs> well, the, the only thing is, well, gee whiz. You can't afford it? Oh, it isn't that we can't afford it. It's just that even without lima beans. Well, naturally, I thought you wanted something rather nice. Oh, we do, it, and I appreciate your offer only... Uh, suppose I think it over. And you'll call me back? Yes, I may, but but if you don't hear from me, don't worry. Well, thank you, Mr. Aldrich. <laughs> Goodbye. And thank you. But, Mother, Mother, we 
can't have a lot of fly-by-night young people who don't take anything seriously dancing around us while our sorority's having a meeting here. My goodness, we have a deficit in the treasury as it is. But, dear, I'm sure they wouldn't pay any attention to your deficit. But that isn't the point. Our president gets nervous with even just us there. Mary, I was simply wondering whether there isn't some way we can help your brother. Robert! Yes, Sam, are you home? Yes, hello. Hello, Mary. Hello, Father. What's the matter with you? Nothing. Her sorority has a deficit. Yeah. Any phone calls for me? Not that I know of, dear. No? Didn't the mansion house phone? No, Sam. No? Now, Sam, you don't have to start putting in phone calls the minute you get home. But, Alice, I left word for them to let me know whether they could take care of our Rotary Club banquet Saturday night. And we're expecting 200 guests. Hello? Number, please. I want, uh, Elm 224. Elm 224? If you please. Sam, do you have any ideas as to where Henry could give his party? Why not right here? Father. Now, Sam. Hello? Hello, is this the mansion house? Yes. Well, this is Mr. Aldrich. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Aldrich. I was wondering whether you'd call me. Did I say I'd call you? Well, I understood you would. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was the other way around. Uh, have you finally decided to go ahead with your party? Oh, yes, definitely. The question is, can you take care of us? I don't know why not. There's nothing complicated about it. Good. Then I don't have anything to worry about. No, not a thing. You just leave it to us. And uh, on second thought, Mr. Aldrich, there won't be any extra charge for the chocolate sauce. For the what? For the chocolate sauce. Oh, they won't? Well, that's fine, that's fine. Goodbye. Goodbye. Alice! Yes, sir. I've got everything all fixed. And what do you think? They're throwing in the chocolate sauce. For what? I don't know, but it's very nice of them to give it to us. Well, isn't that fine? Yes, sir, I've been hoping we'd be able to have our banquet at the mansion house. And you know, Alice, I didn't tell you before, but this year it's going to be a bit more important than usual. In what way? Well, I've heard a rumor that they're going to nominate me for president. Really? Well, dear, you deserve it. Yeah? No wonder you want everything to be especially nice. Everything especially nice about what, Mother? Henry, I'm glad you came into the room. Kathleen and Agnes stopped me on the street and said they'd been trying to get you for two days. They did? They did, Mr. Aldrich? Did they seem apologetic? They said there wasn't anything for you to worry about, and they'd be seeing you at the Methodist Church tomorrow night. At the Methodist Church? What for? I wonder what's going on over there. Boy, I don't know anything more about it than what I've just told you. Well, the nerve of them. That's what I say. You know what they're trying to do, Homer? Come to us on bended knees. In the Methodist Church? <laughs> we'll show them. We're going to give the best party tonight that this town ever saw. Where? M Mother, that's the least of our worries. Something will open up. It always does. And, Homer, do you know what I'm going to the phone and do? What? Double our order of donuts. Homer, how does my necktie look? Wait until we get up here under this lamppost, Henry, and I'll take a look at it. Oh, let's turn here, though. My Aunt Harriet lives up the street. Okay. Your tie looks fine. You know, it was very nice of my Aunt Harriet to call me up and say we could have the party at her house. That's what I was thinking. And did I tell you what else she said? What? She said she had sort of a surprise for us. She did? Sure. You know what that means. She's probably going out and let us have the whole house to ourselves. She is? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> say, I wonder what's going on across the street at the Methodist Church. I'm not interested. As a matter of fact, I'm not either. Hey, Henry, look up the street. Where? Well, gee, what's that all about? Well, there's something going on over at the Mansion House Hotel. Boy, they're all dressed up. There must be a lot of parties going on tonight. But, Henry, there are a couple of hundred people out there on the sidewalk. They're all trying to get in. Maybe they're all getting put out. Oh, look, there's my father. Oh, yeah? And there's mine. Where? Don't you see him with all those men talking to him with his back against the wall? <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, there you are, Homer Brown. Gee whiz, Agnes, where did you come from? We just came from the Methodist Church. That's where we came from. Hello, Kathleen. Henry Aldrich, do you realize everybody's waiting for you? Where? At the church, at the church. You're not interested. You're not interested in your own party? In what party? Now, listen, Agnes, have you been arranging more things? And just what, Homer Brown, do you mean by that insinuation? Now, wait a minute, Agnes, wait a minute. <laughs> And before I sit down, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend the thanks and gratitude of the Rotary Club to several groups and, uh, shall I say, individuals. First, I think we should thank Sam Aldridge for the very clever and original way in which he arranged this evening for us. I needn't tell you that for a few minutes when we first went over to the mansion house, it looked as though Sam had slipped up and arranged a table seating 16 to take care of 200 guests. 
But it was done, of course, simply to teach us a lesson that we mustn't expect sumptuous banquets in these days of war. In fact, in fact, this very delicious dinner consisting of pea soup and peanut butter sandwiches and, uh, shall I say, rice pudding and uh, let's not forget the donuts was just what we needed to bring us back to Earth. While the 15 soldiers who were to be our guests are reading at the mansion house and will join us later. Oh, uh, incidentally, I understand Sam arranged their dinner to end up with a triple-headed dessert. And uh, besides that, Sam Aldrich has asked me to say that we're going to put all the money that we've saved on tonight's dinner into war bonds. What's more, the treasurer of this church has just handed me a report to the effect that their organ has gone over the top. <laughs> and, and I would like to extend our thanks to the good ladies of this church who dropped everything in order to make our banquet the success that it's been. I understand one lady in particular who had planned a Valentine party at her house for her nephew or someone. At the last minute, commandeered all her adult guests and brought them down here to help serve leaving the youngsters to shift for themselves as best they can. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce our genial chairman and next president, Sam Aldrich. Ladies and gentlemen, frankly, I don't know what to say. Those parties seemed to straighten out nicely for everyone, didn't they? But if you think Mr. Aldrich's troubles are over, just you stay tuned in to find out what happened the next morning. And now let me remind you that Postum, for years the favorite mealtime drink in millions of American homes, is made for your convenience in two forms. Instant Postum, which you make instantly in the cup, and Postum cereal, which you make in pot, percolator, or drip maker. Both forms make the same delicious, distinctive drink. So no matter which form of postum you choose, you'll enjoy a mealtime cup that's a real treat. Good breakfast, Alice. Thank you, Sam. Father, will you have another donut? No, thank you. Go ahead, have one. Henry, I have already had three. Oh. You know, Mother, I think that was a very good idea you had about lunch. What idea was that? To make a little custard to pour over the donuts. <laughs> Incidentally, Alice, I won't be here for dinner. Listen again next week to the Aldrich family, same time, same station, for another sparkling half hour with your favorite youngster, his family, and his pals. The Aldrich family, starring Ezra Stone, is written by Clifford Goldsmith. Original music is composed and conducted by Jack Miller. This is Harry Vonzell saying, You will enjoy fragrant, flavorful Postum. And remember, Postum contains no stimulants. It cannot make you nervous. Good night. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. It's Mildred Bailey featuring Paul Barron and his orchestra with Teddy Wilson, Charlie Shavers, Red Norvo, and Spex Powell. And Mildred's guests, the Delta Rhythm Boys and Jimmy Dorsey. If you want to get to heaven, I'll tell you how Start in living the right way now Keep your hands on the plow Hold on. And here's your rocking chair lady, Mildred Bailey. Hi, everybody. Come right in and cut yourself a share of kicks around that old rocking chair while we make music till midnight. 
I'm starting things off with the answer to a lot of requests that have been coming in asking me to do a full-length version of the modern spiritual that opens our show. Here it is. Hold on. No one, no one let me come in. Doors all fastened and the windows thin. Keep your hands on the plow. Hold on. Noah said you done lost your track. Can't plow straight and keep a looking back. Keep your hands on the plow. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Keep your hands on the plow. Hold on. Mary had a golden chain. Every link was the good Lord's name. Keep your hands on the plow. Hold on. Keep on plowing, don't you tire. Every row goes higher and higher. Keep your hands on the plow. Hold on. Get to heaven, I'll tell you how. God is living the right way now. Everything works out somehow. Hold on. If that plow stays in your hand, land you straight in the promised land. Keep your hands on the plow. Hold on. Hold on. Zanzibar is a singing group that rates four stars wherever it goes. Sorry. You heard them on the radio, seen them in the movies, mm. listened to their wonderful recordings, some of which I had the pleasure of making with them, and it's the Delta Rhythm Boys. Visiting, visiting us tonight and cutting out with a unique arrangement, how am I doing? Snow quality, Jojo, I'm going to get that out. <laughs> Me, Jojo, a sheep from the big snow, loved a maid named Moonglow. And what do you know? What do you know? Just to have us gone local. 
Who's the quality of me, Jojo? Oh, Jojo. What are you gonna do there, Jo? Better be jiving her some more. How did she tell you you should draw so long? I'm the quality of me, Jojo. Keep help she from the big snow. Jive the chick named Moonglow. Ha ha. Papa, what do you know? Yo ho. I said, honey, Mama. I'll catch you. Take you to my pad and win that G. We got a great big bundle of scratchy. Uh. I'm gonna buy you a wedding bow. Jojo, you know that you can't jive Our Triple B survey, the Bailey Baron Ballad Poll, shows us that your choice this week is a beautiful Duke Ellington Bob Russell ballad, I Didn't Know About You. I ran around with my own little crowd. The usual laugh, not often but loud. And in the world that I knew, I didn't know about you. Chasing after the rain on the merry-go-round, just taking my fun. Where it could be found And yet what else could I do I didn't know about you Darling, now I know I had the loneliest yesterday Every day in your arms I know For once in my life I'm living Had a good time Every time I went out Romance was a thing I kidded about How could I know about love I didn't know about you. Our solid sextet, Teddy Wilson, Charlie Frantic Shaver, Tommy Kane, Al Hall, Red Norvo, 
and Beck Powell. They're off to the tune of Tab Diner. Ow. <laughs> across the lot that are every bit as good today as they ever were. With some of that smooth, barren background, the one I'm going to sing now is that wonderful love song, It's Funny That Way. <laughs> Why should I leave him 
Why should I go? He'd be unhappy without me, I know. I got a man crazy for me. He's funny that way. program notes on what you're bringing us tonight. Why, sure, Daddy. Miss Dee. <laughs> tonight, the Baron Van Blue Plate is another original by the young man whose music we introduced to you last week, Paul Lane. You'll recall that that one was titled, It Takes One Deep Breath. And this week, we're doing another one of his called, A Second Wind. <laughs>
tell him from the Capitol Theater to see us? It's the man with the sizzling saxophone, James Dorsey. <laughs> Welcome to our ball, Jimmy. Well, thank you kindly, Miss B. Miss B is the name. What's yes, been keeping you away, old man, as if I didn't know? Well, I've just been romping around the town, playing the theaters, benefits, shows, you. bond rallies, and a lot of other things. Loafing again, huh? Where are you heading for next? Well, next is Newark. Uh-oh. Then I'm bound for Boston. Then we're going to fly down to, to Florida. That's in there. Looks like I'll be with you, man. You mean just a tour with an armature? Oh. <laughs> Say, Jimmy, remember those groovy bakes with the Dorsey Brothers Orchestra when we recorded Is That Religion? Stop Your Shouting in that Amen Corner? Snowball and stuff? Yeah, Mildred, we really pitched some fine platters in those Say we did. What are you fixing to play for us tonight, Jimmy? Matter of fact, I don't know, Millie. Hey, hey Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy, why not run one down with that solid success? Good deal. Why don't we make it? Why do I come in? How's for doing I got rhythm on your clarinetti? <laughs> well, okay, Mildred. Paul, if you'll beat it off, we can each take one course and then jam the last one. Right, Jimmy, let's go. Solid! <laughs> from the hit show Boomer Girl, Evelina. Evelina, won't you ever take a shine through that moon? Evelina, ain't you bothered by the bobbling too?
they used to smell it. Watermelon clinging to another fellow's vine. Evelina, won't you roll up that vine and be mine? Radio Service. American adventurers comes Bulldog Drummond. Come with me to North Beach, one of the finest beaches in the Atlantic. Famous for its swimming, sports, and for Wind's Wonderland, a gay, exciting sport land without equal. Anthony Wynn, an old friend of mine from Mayfair, had opened his fun palace on the sound, a short run out of the city. That evening, a gay crowd had gathered. had come for thrills, for laughter. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Wind's Wonderland on the Sound, the greatest play land, the greatest thrill land in the East. Come closer, ladies and gentlemen. See the greatest thrill ride in America. The fastest, greatest, the most daring roller coaster ride in the world. The whirlwind. The tenth part of a dollar, ladies and gentlemen. Ten cents to ride with the wind, to feel the thrill of flying, to live dangerously. Step right up to the fastest place. All off, end of the ride. All right, mister, this is the end of the line. All off. Hey, mister. Hey, Barker. Barker, to me, there's something's the matter with this guy here. Now, what's going on here? Hey, look, mister, you have to get off or pay for another ride. Hey, don't you hear me? Hey, stand back, please. Don't cry. Hey, what's the matter with him? This man is dead. Hey, move back there. Let me get him off. Now, wait a minute. Trump went here. Hold it. It's Mr. Wayne, the owner of the place. Captain Drummond speaking. Oh, Captain Drummond, thank goodness I reached you. This is Isabel Wynn. Do you remember Anthony Wynn's daughter? Anthony Wynn? Why, of course, Miss Wynn. How are you? It's been two years since I've seen you. How's father? Captain Drummond, something terrible has happened. What is it? My father. He's dead. Dead? Yes, they say it was an accident, but I know better. It was murder. Somebody killed my father. Murder? Now, Miss Wynn, uh, tell me as simply as you can what happened. I don't know. I saw father only a half hour ago, and he was fine then. 
And then they told me that he'd been riding on the roller coaster and they found him in his seat dead. But what makes you think it's murder? Father didn't just die. I know he didn't. Somebody killed him, Captain Drummond. And you've got to help me. You've got to come out here. Now, Miss Wynn, I'll do whatever I possibly can. Benny and I'll leave immediately. Yes. Tell me, where are you now? At the Wonderland, out at North Beach. All right. Now, please try to steady yourself. Hold tight until we get there. And, Miss Wynn, don't tell anyone you think your father's death was murder. Miss Wynn, are you sure you're all right? Yes, Captain Drummond. I was upset when I still tell you that I'm all right now. Really, I am. You're very brave, Miss Wynn, very brave. But this is Miller, our Barker, Captain Drummond. He's the man who first found father. How do you do, Miller? Now, can you tell me exactly what happened? Well, the, the roller coaster came in at the end of the ride, and I, I saw someone lying slumped over in a seat. I didn't know it was Mr. Wynn until I went over and picked him up. And there he was, Captain Drummond, dead. How was he lying? Well, like I said, slumped over, his head down on his chest, way over on the right side of the car. What was Mr. Wynn doing on that ride? Well, I guess he was testing it. What do you mean, testing it? Well, he did it every week, just about this time. He'd always take the ride himself to see if the whirlwind was in good condition. He's been doing it for years. Yes, that's right, Captain Drummond. Well, they said he'd never asked a patron to ride on the coaster if he himself wouldn't ride on it. Hmm. But why should this ride have killed him then? I don't know, Captain. The doctor here said it was his heart. Well, it's true. Father's heart was never good. And recently, he'd taken a turn for the worst. Miller and I finally persuaded him to see a doctor about it. We drove in together yesterday. And the doctor said to avoid overstrain and sudden shock. Miss Wynn, I never saw your father get on a whirlwind. If I had, I'd have stopped him. Yes, I know you would, Miller. Thank you. Well, Miller, you've been very helpful. I think you'd better get back to your work now. The crowd seems a little jittery, upset by the accident. See what you can do to quiet them. All right, I'll do my best, Captain Drummond. If you should need me, I'll uh, be glad to help. Miss Wynn, I, I don't like to ask you this again, but what makes you think your father was murdered? I made him promise me yesterday, after we'd seen the doctor, that he wouldn't go on the whirlwind again. And he said that he'd let Miller test it in the future. But Captain Drummond, father didn't go on that ride voluntarily. Hmm. Had your father any enemies here? Enemies? No. Except perhaps Mr. Carlson, but... No, I, I wouldn't say they were enemies. Mr. Carlson? Yes, he's the owner of the large oyster house a few piers down on the sound. Uh, you see that neon sign on the yacht out there in the bay? Uh, where? No, no, there. That, that ship anchored just beyond the jetty. Oh, yes, yes, I see. Yes. Carlson's oysters are in season. Pretty color that sign makes. That's it. He's a sort of competitor of father's. He runs a resort on the Jersey coast. And he made us an offer to buy out the Wonderland a few days ago, but my father wouldn't sell. They had some words about it, but nothing serious. I see. Did he threaten your father? Oh, no. No, oh, nothing like that. Why, Captain Drummond, you don't think... I don't think anything yet, Miss Wynn. I'm just asking questions. And the next thing I want to know is how to take a ride on the roller coaster. Denny and I are going for a trip on the whirlwind. back there, Denny? Oh, yes, sir. This is quite a ride, sir. Quite a daring ride. You're right. That last ship was very steep. Steep enough, I'd say, to kill a man with a weak heart. You, you mean, sir, you believe Mr. Wynn was really killed? I'm not sure yet. Oh, wait, wait, don't move, Denny. Uh, what's that, sir? Don't move. Now, tell me, where are you sitting? Why, here, sir. Back here on the left side of the seat. That's it, on the left side of the seat. That last dip curved sharply to the right. The speed of the roller coaster would naturally throw us both to the left. Naturally, sir. I purposely sat alone in the front seat, Denny, with you in the seat behind me. See what would happen. Well, I'm sorry to be dull, sir, but I don't see what you're driving at. Miller, the barker, told us that he found Wynn's body slumped over in the front seat on the right-hand side of the car. That means he couldn't possibly have been on that ride alone. Otherwise, that last dip would have thrown him over to the left the way it did us. Then he wasn't alone, sir, when he took that fatal ride. No. Someone rode alongside of him. Someone who knew he had a weak heart and knew he couldn't stand the shock of that last drop. Someone who forced him on that ride. Then you mean, sir, that Miss Wynn was right. 
Her father didn't die accidentally. Mr. Wynn was murdered on his own roller coaster. Well, Isabel, you were right. Then father was murdered, Captain Holmes. Yes. Someone forced him on that roller coaster, knowing the sharp curves and drops would be too much for his heart. Oh, well, who would want to do that, sir? I don't know yet. Now, Isabel, I want you to tell me what other attractions you have here at Wonderland. Well, we have a shooting gallery here, as you see. Yes. And uh, what's down there? Well, just past the shooting range, over to the left, you can see the hills around. Then there's a carousel across the road. Why, what are you after, Captain Drummond? I don't know yet. I'm just getting an idea. Go on. That's about all. Except for the whirlwind and the ride in the moonlight. A uh, ride in the moonlight? What's that? Oh, it sounds very romantic, sir. It is. It's a kind of modern old mill built right out into the water. Your boy and a girl like a boat ride in the moonlight. Well, we fixed up some boats with outboard motors, and the couples take them out on the sound. I'd like to see that ride, Isabel. It's just around the corner here, but I don't think you'll find it very exciting. Just you can't tell. Well, there it is. Ride in the moonlight. See, the boats leave through that passageway on the right. And they ride under a tunnel for about 50 yards, and then they're out in the sound. The route beyond the tunnel is marked by buoys, and you run along the sound for about a minute, and then back through another tunnel to the sky. Hmm. Very ingenious. It sounds very attractive. It's very popular, too. Isabel, would you care to take a ride in the moonlight with me? Uh, with me and Denny, of course. Why, yes, Captain Drummond, if you think it worthwhile. I do. Ah, here's a boat, sir. It's called the Rhoda. You see, all the boats have names. The very pretty craft, as I may say so. All right, the Rhoda will do. Oh, excuse me, sir, Miss Wynn, uh, but the Rhoda's out of commission. We got to overhaul her. Why not take this boat, the Mary Ann? She's in shipshape condition and just as comfortable. Very well, the Mary Ann it is. Uh, give the motor a turn, will you, Danny? Right, sir. Ah, ready, sir. Here we go. I say, sir, it's quite dark in this tunnel. That seems to be the idea, Denny. We'll be out on the sound in just a minute now. You haven't noticed anything yet, have you? I mean, anything out of the ordinary? No, everything seems to be in order. <laughs> The motor, sir. I, I think it backfired. That wasn't backfired, Denny. That was a gunshot. Keep low, Isabel. Someone's watching us. Someone's anxious to keep us from learning something. I'll be back in a moment to continue my story. Denny and I discovered that Anthony Wynn, an old friend of mine, was murdered. His accidental death due to heart failure was no accident, but a coldly planned killing. And in our search for the killer, Denny and I were in one of the little ride-in-the-moonlight boats with Isabel and his daughter. In the darkness of the tunnel, a shot came out. Keep low, Isabel. Someone's watching us. Someone's anxious to keep us from learning something. Denny, can you speed up that motor? I tried, sir. No, I can't. It, it's set at a fixed speed. All right, we'll just have to hug the bottom, then. Keep down, both of you. Hold on. What's that? What's that? The constant sign on his yacht there, the Oysters R and Season sign. See it? Yes. Flashing off and on. I never saw that before. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten flashes. What do you make of it, sir? Denny, what time is it? Oh, it's, it's hard to make out in this light, sir. Oh, it's just fifteen minutes before ten o'clock, sir. Ten o'clock, that's it. I think I've got it. Well, they'd have to work faster than I thought. What do you mean, Captain Robbins? We've got to get back to shore. Denny and I are going to Carlson's Oyster Bar. We're going to investigate some oysters on the half shell. Let's move over to the Oyster Bar, Denny. Is it ten yet? Almost, sir. It's about three minutes before the hour. Keep your eyes open. For what, sir? Anything unusual? Denny. Yes, sir. That man there at the oyster bar. The one taking the box of oysters, sir? Yes. Because I heard him order a dozen oysters to take out. Let's move over and I'll stumble against him. I'm 
try to knock the package out of his hand. See if you can get one of those oysters. I'll try, sir. Excuse me, sir. Could you spare me a match? I... Oh, I'm... You clumsy fool! Oh, I say, I'm dreadfully sorry. Really, I am here. Let me help you pick them up. Get away from here! Get away, you stumbling idiot! Leave those oysters alone! Don't you touch them! I kill you! I don't want your help! Get out of my way! You fool! You bundling fool! Good work, Denny. Yeah, what a fancy temper. There must be something the matter with that man. Did you get one? Did, did you see that man, sir? He turned purple with rage. I never saw anything like it in my life. Yes, yeah. yes, I saw him, Denny. I think I know why. You did get one of the oysters, didn't you? Oh, yes, I did, sir. And most amazing, sir, these oysters aren't opened. I never heard of anyone ordering unopened oysters before, did you, sir? Not unless they aren't to be eaten. What do you mean, Captain Drummond? I'll know in a moment. Give me that oyster, Denny. Uh, no, 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 not here. Come over to the corner. I want to open it. Open it, sir? Give me a knife. Thank you. There, that does it. Well, that isn't an oyster, sir. No, Denny. There's a small white package in between these oyster shells. What do you make of it, sir? Come on, I'll tell you as we go. We haven't a moment to waste. We're going for another ride on the Mary Ann. Another exciting ride in the moonlight. Well, what about that oyster, sir? Dope, Denny. Dope, sir? Yes. The oyster house is merely a blind for dope peddling. They take oysters, open them slightly, remove the meat, put in the drug, and close the shelf again. I thought it was hard for a man to come up to the oyster bar and order a dozen oysters in season to take out. One doesn't ask for oysters in season, unless one means something besides oysters. Oh, I see, sir. And that man I encountered, he must have been a purchaser. That's why he was so furious when I bumped into him. That man was an addict. You notice his face, the horrible tenseness of his eyes, and the stiffness of his body? Yes, I did. He seemed almost ready to kill me, sir. And he might have. If he'd seen you take an oyster. Such men are desperate, and they'll stand for no interference. Denny, it was this that Mr. Wynne discovered before he was killed. You mean they found out that Mr. Wynne knew of their traffic in the foul drug, eh, sir? Exactly. And Carlson, knowing Mr. Wynne had a weak heart, forced him to ride on the whirlwind, thereby murdering him. Yes, but how could Carlson know that, sir? Miller, the barker. You remember he drove Miss Wynne and her father in to see the doctor yesterday? Then Miller looked in it, too. I, I said, Captain Drummond, where are you taking the boat? You're not following the boys. You're going out further into the town. We're taking a detour, Denny. We're going to visit Carlson's yacht. I suspect it's much more than an advertisement for the Oyster House, and much more than a yacht. Then he shut off the motor. We'll glide in. I don't want to broadcast our approach. Right, sir. Look, Denny. That boat there. Why, it's the rotor, sir. But the starter told us it was out of working order. Yes, out of working order for us. But an important part in Carlton's plan. What do you mean, sir? Never mind right now. Let's get up these steps and aboard. Walk quietly, Denny. There's no need to be what? quiet, Captain Drummond. We've been expecting you. Carlson. Yes, Captain Drummond, Carlson. I'm flattered you should know me without an introduction. Oyster house owner, yachtman, and as you have so ably demonstrated, smuggler. But right now, I'm the business end of a gun. Get up here, quick. Probably. Very clever, Carlson. Now, back over there to that door. We uh, couldn't understand why you took so long in getting here. Perhaps the Marianne was too slow. You should have tried the road. She's much faster, as your charming friend, Miss Wynne, can tell you. Miss Wynne? Is she? Yes. I took the precaution of inviting Miss Wynne to my yacht. We will say that uh, she is my guest. She occupies the cabin here. Not a very willing guest, I might add, but nevertheless a guest. I warn you, Carlson, if you harm Miss Wynne... I want Drummond to I give the orders here. Now open that door. Down those steps and be quick about it. We'll open that door and get inside. Ah, uh, this is the anchor room, Drummond. The room in which the anchor chain piles when we lift anchor. You see the windlass there and the chain attached. I'm uh, sorry it's not very comfortable. 
And when we hoist anchor, you may find it a bit overcrowded. But uh, <laughs> you won't mind it for long. We uh, take off at uh, five past eleven. Just about to pull anchor. You know this is murder, don't you, Carlson? First win, and now us. Win? Murder? Oh, well, that was heart failure, Drummond. Heart failure. You heard the doctor's report. And as for you, I didn't know you'd stowed away on my boat. And I never thought you'd hide in the anchor chain room. Your uh, accidental oh. death will come as a shock to me, Captain oh. A great blow. Well, I see we're hoisting anchor. Hey, goodbye, uh, Captain Drummond. The door, Denny. See if we can move it. Right. Now it's no use. It's two inches of steel. I say, the, the chain is beginning to fill up the room, sir. We've got to stop it. We've got to find something to keep that chain from piling in here. Quick, Denny, come around here. Give me a hand with this pipe. Coming, sir. One chance in 10,000, Denny, but we've got to take it. This steam pipe here may provide the power for hoisting the anchor. There must be a steam winch somewhere here, and I think this pipe is it. Oh, here, here, take this rag. Wrap it around your hands and pull this way toward me when I say so. Right, sir. I'm ready. All right, then. Pull. Ending. I want to pull together. Pull. Watch out, Jenny. That live steam is gone. You behind it. Ah, I say you've got it, sir. The anchor stopped moving. Hand me that spread at all, will you, Jenny? Yes, yeah, sir. Now, if I can force this piece of rag into the pipe of the stick, I'll be able to plug up that steam. Give me a hand, Denny, but watch out for the steam. Good. Now, help me bend this pipe in the direction of the door. They'll be down in a minute to find out what's wrong, and we'll be able to greet them properly. That's got it. Now, stand back, Denny. What's going on in there? Come on, get out of there, both of you. No, here's something you didn't expect. That's got it, Denny. The force of that steam is like a blow in the head. No look out. Then it's done. Like that. Now, help me plug up this pipe. We've got to get on deck. sooner we get up on deck, the quicker we'll get to Carson. All right, Drummond, your little escape is over. Drop that gun. Very clever stopping that anchor. Now, right, get over there, both of you. Back up against that cabin. It looks as if my anchor method was a little too subtle for you. I gotta use the crudest method of all to get rid of you. A bullet through your head. You'll never get away with us, Carson. Now, save the talk. Now, who wants it first? You, Drummond, or you... Oh! Good work, Miss Wynn. Get those guns, Denny. I've got them, sir. Now, up with your hands, Carlson. Up with them, I say. Why, you... Lord. Never mind that, Carlson. Get over here. Denny, give me one of those guns. Who hit me? I did. You were so sure of yourself, Carlson, you never saw Miss Wynn lean out of the cabin porthole. Denny, go unlock that door and let Miss Wynn out. Right, sir. If I may say so, sir, it's a great privilege to unlock the door for the guardian angel... Are you all right, Isabel? Yes, I'm fine. Good. Denny, go down in the hold and pick up Miller. He'll be coming too just about now. Right, sir. Oh, and Denny. Yes, sir. I want to get Carlson and Miss Wynn back to shore. We'll take the Mary Ann. The rotor's still tied on at the landing steps. Bring Miller up and take him back with you in the rotor. Keep an eye on him, Denny. Keep a finger on your trigger. I'll take good care of him, sir. See you later. Have a pleasant ride, Mr. Carlson. Captain Drummond, did this man kill my father? Yes, he and Miller. They did it together. Your father found out that Carlson was running more than an oyster house. That's why Carlson tried to buy him out. And then when father wouldn't sell, he forced him on the roller coaster. But why? Because he was smuggling dope. That was it? Yes. He brought the drugs into the sound on his yard and used the ride your father was operating as a blind for his smuggling. He landed his stuff on shore through the ride in the moonlight. The ride in the moonlight? Yes. One of his men, and perhaps a woman, to make it look like two people enjoying the ride, would buy a ticket, run the boat out through the tunnel into the sound, 
and then they'd steer out to the yard where the packages would be picked up. I see. And in those packages? Oysters. What? Mm-hmm. Oysters packed with a drug. In case they were discovered in the process, those packages were very proper. Just a box of oysters bought at Carlson's Oyster Bar. How did you find out about the ride in the moonlight? Well, when we took our first ride, you remember the attendant said not to take the rotor that she was out of order? Yes, I do remember. Well, I ran my hand across the motor. It was still hot. The boat was in good shape. And as I judged from the make of the motor, faster than the other boats. And then there was oil on the front of the boat. Oil? Yes, Carlson, oil. When we took that first ride, Isabel, and stayed in the lanes marked for the ride, our boat didn't pick up any oil. But the rotor had oil in her bow. Now, oil on the sound can mean only one thing, a vessel. Carlson's yacht is the only vessel within half a mile. That was the last piece to the puzzle. Uh, the last piece but one. What do you mean, the last but one? The last question was how to get off Carlson's yacht with him pointing a gun at me. And you answered that one, Isabel. With my good right hand. Yes. When we've deposited our murderer here and Denny comes in with Miller, the ride in the moonlight will be restricted to couples interested exclusively in the moon. horse with a speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty, hi Silver, the Lone Ranger. His faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. The stories of his strength and courage, his daring and resourcefulness, have come down to us through the generations, and nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver! Faster, boy, faster! Oh, Silver! Boy! Along a narrow crevasse banked by steep mountain slopes, three horsemen rode. The sun beat down on the rocky trail and glinted from the silver hoofs of a white stallion whose rider, tall and bronzed, wore a black mask and six guns within easy reach of his lean, strong fingers. Close behind him rode an Indian, dressed in buckskin, and a boy. They were the Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Dan Reed, the masked man's 14-year-old nephew. Steady, Silver. Golly, this trail is treacherous. Ah, we haven't much farther to go. The crevasse ends just beyond that bend, and the trail breaks across Green Valley. Green Valley? Well, that's where we're heading. Well, Lazy B. Ranch. Yes, Dan. 
We'll be able to see the ranch from that ridge. What we do there? I don't know yet, Tato. Jeff Holland's note only said that he needed our help. Uh-huh. Is he the owner of the ranch? Yes, and an old friend. Tato and I knew him years ago when he was a cowpuncher. Uh-huh. Him richest cattleman in country now. Gosh, the lazy bee must be some ranch. Yes, I... What is it, Silver? You look ahead on trail. It looks like a man. Like he's been shot. Come on, Silver. Get him up. Get up, boy. Oh, Silver. Oh, 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 oh. Bring the canteen, Dan. You bet. I don't... I don't... Look. Uh, it's just a dummy. Like it's stuffed inside a man's clothes. Oh, uh, that's strange. Oh, golly, why would anybody... Outlaws. There they are up on the slopes. I'm behind the rocks on both sides of the trail. Back to the horses, quick. Right ahead, I'll cover you. We'll all fight it out from here. There are too many of them. Hurry, Dan. Get him up there, Tom. Don't do us, Silver. All right, big fellow. Come on, Silver. Yes, Dan. Outlaws, that dummy is not a trap. They wanted us off our horses so we'd make easy targets. Uh, trap, well planned. Then make sure they're not shelter for us anywhere. Why would they want to ambush us? We'll know more about that when we reach the ranch. Come on, Silver. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the Lazy Bee Ranch, Peggy Hollins, the rancher's pretty daughter, was tightening the cinch on her saddle of Sandy, the handsome but high-strung new mare her father had bought for her birthday. Oh, oh still, Sandy. I'm almost finished. <laughs> oh, steady, girl. There's nothing to be afraid of. Well, let me tighten that cinch for you, Miss Peggy. <laughs> Put it down, Sandy. No one's going to hurt you. Quiet now. Quiet, girl. I told you never to come near this mare again, Flint. No sense in getting mad. I only want to help. I don't need your kind of help. I needed a Sandy. You almost broke her spirit when Dad brought her here. Now she's afraid whenever you're around. Oh, steady, Sandy, quiet. I'm right sorry if I've offended you, Miss Peggy. Oh, uh, there's a dance in town Saturday night. If you'd go with me, I'd No. Be... You don't like me, is that it? I'm trying to make it as clear as I can. Maybe if I had money in a ranch like your paws, you'd change the tune. It's got nothing to do with it. Dad thinks you're a good foreman, though I don't know why. What do you mean by that? It seems to me a good foreman would find a way to stop the outlaws who are rustling our steers. Five hundred more were stolen last week. And if this keeps up, Dad will be wiped out. I'm doing the best I can. Well, your best isn't good enough. If you don't put a stop to the rustling soon, Flint... I'm going to speak to Dad about a new foreman. Come on, Sandy. Get up, girl. New foreman, huh? A couple of months, your pa won't be able to afford a foreman or anything else. When that happens, I'll be here to take over the ranch. Maybe then you won't be so high and mighty. There's somebody coming. Ace. Oh, oh, there. Oh, boy. Oh, steady there. Steady. Didn't I tell you to never show yourself around the ranch? You want to spill the whole game? <coughs> I had it come, Flint. Find that fence where nobody'd see you. No. What's so important? The Lone Ranger, he got away. What do you mean? Just what I said. He got through the crevasse without a scratch. Saved the engine and the kid, too. Oh, you blundering fool. That trap I laid was tight as a drum. All you had to do was riddle him from the slopes. Yeah, it sounded slick enough, but there are a couple of things about the masked man you overlooked. His horse and the way he handles his gun. I don't savvy. He winged three of my men with the engine and the kid hightailed it. That white horse of his lit out after him like a streak. <laughs> Never saw such fancy shooting and riding in my life. Well, we didn't have a chance to riddle him. Yeah, that hombre spells trouble. That's why I planned that trap when Jeff Hollins told me he'd sent for the Lone Ranger to investigate the rustling. I'll take care of him yet. Well, you'd better work fast. They'll be here any minute. I'd beat him by taking the shortcut. You boys all set for the night? Oh, yeah. How many steers are there in the pack? Five hundred. Cut him out of the herd myself and put him in the north pasture. He won't be bothered with many guards, so make sure there's no slippers. <laughs> they haven't been yet. Don't worry. We'll make them cows disappear without a trace. The same as always. Look, three horsemen heading this way. What's well, them? The little ranger, the engine, and the kid. Get moving. I don't want them to see you here. <laughs> you better take care of them. That masked hombre will take care of us. Get up there, horse. Get up, horse. 
take care of them. Next time, it'll be for keeps. It was dusk when three men, a girl and a boy, reined in their horses on the bank of a stream which marked the western boundary of the Lazy Bee Ranch. They were Jeff Hollins, owner of the ranch, his daughter Peggy, and the Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Dan. Well, there they are, cattle tracks, hundreds of them, all going into that stream. But nary a one of them coming out. I see. We've searched both banks for miles in each direction, but we haven't found a single clue as to where the steers left the water. Gosh, that's funny. All that stock cattle just vanished into thin air. Uh-huh. I've lost 5,000 head in three months. I've got to get them back or sell the ranch. Oh, Dad, you didn't tell me it was that bad. Well, I didn't want to worry you, Piggy. Do the steers always enter the water at this point? Well, as far as I've been able to discover. The rustlers must have a reason for that. A reason connected with the opposite shore. Well, we've looked there after every raid. There isn't a trace of the cattle. Well, they'd be loco to run the steers out there. Where would they take them? That cliff on the opposite bank would cut off their escape 50 feet from the water's edge. Let's have a closer look. Come on, Silver. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. All right. Easy there. Golly. Looks a lot taller than it looked across the stream. Ah. It's plenty steep, too. I can't see the rock for the scrubs and vines. Like it's wearing a false face. False face. Oh, it's so dark now, we won't be able to see cattle tracks, even if there are any. Yes, we'd better give up now and start fresh in the morning. Listen. Oh, rustlers. Well, they're after more of the herd. They're in the north pasture. Oh, the guards are fighting them. Dad, there's so few they'll be killed. Stay behind, Dan. Come on, Silver. Stay with Dan, Peggy. But Dad, I can handle a gun. You do as I say. Hit him up, Scout. Come on, Silver. <laughs> Guards are putting up a step of fight than I expected, Ace. Yeah, don't worry, Flint. There's only a few. The boys will turn them when they stampede the steers. Hey, it's just a lone ranger. He's heading this way. Stay down, you fool. Oh. Oh, the guards winged me. Yeah, you gave them an easy target. Moving out from behind a brush like that. Big Call off your boys. we got to get out of here. That man's down. We may have the ranchers with him. Leave them steers. Head for the hideout. Get up, that boy. Get up now. Get up there. What about you, Flint? You ain't supposed to be anywhere near the north pasture tonight. How are you going to explain that gun wound to Harlan? Uh, I'll ride to the hideout with you. You got to think of something. Well, let's go then. Hide, tail, and fire! Get up there, Harlan! Come on! Whipping their mounts feverishly, the outlaws put the herd between them and the Lone Ranger Tonto and Jeff Holland. Then, unaware, they far outnumbered the masked men and his friends who remained behind to care for the wounded cattle guards. The rustlers raced for the mountain stream. As they neared their goal, they suddenly saw a girl and a young boy slowly riding toward them. Like Peggy Hollins. And the kid who travels with the Lone Ranger. Grab him! Don't let him get away! Corral them two boys! Poor oh, damn sweet Peggy! No, you don't! Oh, 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 I got it! Oh, oh there! Study there! Oh. That's a ticket. Flint! <laughs> yeah. You're the one who's been stealing our stock! Well, you low down coyote! Get up! I give the orders around here. What'll we do with them, Flint? Take them to the hideout. I've got an idea not only to explain this gun wound, but trap the Lone Ranger and the engine as well. <laughs> Sometime later, the Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Jeff Hollins, scouting the ranch for the missing Peggy and Dan, saw a lone horseman approach in the gloom of the night and suddenly slide from his mount to the ground. Oh, Silver, oh, boy. Oh, oh, God. God. Oh, oh. Well, it's Flint, my ranch foreman. Steady, Silver. Been wounded in the water, Tonto. Ah, me bring it. Here. needed that drink. What happened? I was riding down in the stream when I, when I saw the rustlers heading that way. They they caught Miss Peggy and the kid. Captured my daughter? Yeah, I, I trailed them, figured I'd find their hideout, but after I'd followed them some ways, they, they saw me and gave me the slug. I, I had to turn back. Can you describe the trail? No. It was too dark to make note of any landmarks, but I can find the trail myself. I see. 
My arm will be fixed well enough for me to travel in the morning. I'll take you toward the hideout. We're the only skunks kidnapping my daughter, huh? We'll show them we'll take along a posse and blow them to kingdom come. No, no, that won't do, Mr. Holmes. You see, the trail leads through open country. Posse would be sure to be seen. But the Lone Ranger and town could get through and size up the situation. Uh, I reckon you're right. But my daughter's in danger, Flint, and I aim to ride with them. We'll start first thing in the morning. And make sure you don't lose the way. I won't lose the way. The next day, Flint led the Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Jeff on the fake trail of the outlaws. You sure this is the trail, Flint? Yeah, this is it. Right around that bend over here is where they gunned me. Kimasabi, me not like Flint. Me not trust him. All right, Tonto. The rustlers did ride over this path last night. They didn't leave tracks. Mm, that's right. Here's the bend. Get here, boys. It's an ambush. Uh-huh. Don't give them the tracks, boys. Come on, ride them down. Curtain falls on the first act of tonight's Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Continue our story. Racing from behind the sagebrush where they'd been waiting, the outlaws encircled the Lone Ranger, Tonto, and their ranch friend, and pressed in from all sides. Against the wrestlers' overwhelming odds, the three defenders fought fiercely, but even their flailing fists could not withstand the renegades for long. There's too many for us, Tonto. Hold him, drag him off the horse. Line him down. Let them, Silver. Get you. Look out. Let them, big fellow. Hold. Oh. At that moment, a gun butt fell on the masked man's head with stunning force. Reeling, half-conscious, in a blinding flash of pain and darkness, the Lone Ranger instinctively gripped the horn of his saddle and hung on. The mighty Silver reared with rage at the fate of his master, and his hoofs splashed with increasing fury. While Flint and several others held Tonto and Jeff Hollins. Hey, Jeff Hollins, too. Hurry up and corral that mask. Hey, right. Hang on to them. This horse is a fighting fool. Fall back. Drill the Lone Ranger. Get out of that horse's way, boys. When he starts rearing, riddle the mask man. <laughs> you not shoot him. Get him up, Silver. Get him up. Drill him. That horse is running away. Let him have it, boys. Shoot him off the horse's back. They're getting away. Chase him. Oh, we ain't a chance of catching him now, Flint. That horse is about the fastest thing on legs. Oh, Bless him. The Lone Ranger ain't cheating Boot Hill that easy. Yeah, well, what can we do? I'll show you. Tie up the engine and Jeff Hollins. We'll deal the masked man a new hand. A short distance down the trail in the opposite direction taken by Silver and his half-conscious master, the outlaws reined in their horses. Before them was an ominous-looking grass-covered patch between mountainous boulders. Oh, 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 oh. Steady, steady, boy. What are we stopping here for, Flint? See that grass patch? Yeah, I see it. Innocent-looking, ain't it? Like it might be just a regular patch of prairie grass. But it ain't. Hand me that rock. <coughs> what are you aiming to do with it? I'm going to toss it at that patch. I want to show the engine and Jeff a little surprise we've got for him. Watch. Well, it, it sank right into the ground. <laughs> yeah, just like Jeff and the Redskin are going to sink. Quicksand. You said it, quicksand. 
A mud bath for both of you over your heads. <laughs> this is one time the dead will bury themselves. Uh, you not give us fighting chance. Oh, you yellow-livered polecats, cut these ropes around our wrists and let us go down like men. Maybe we'd better put a couple of slugs in them, Flint, and be done with it. The Lone Ranger will be on our trail as soon as he gets his full senses. <laughs> That's what I want him to do. What do you mean? As soon as he gets over the effects of that blow, he'll ride after us. So is to free his friends. You'll see that you get what's coming to you, Flint. You're a little mixed up, Jeff. This time the mass down will get what's coming to him. Yeah, don't savvy. What's the quick When the Lone Ranger spots his friends in that muck, he'll have to work fast to get them free before they sink. Yeah. But while he's doing it, we'll hide with the boys behind them boulders and pick them off. <laughs> You think of everything, don't you, Flint? <laughs> Whip up them horses, boys. Hey, you don't aim to drown the horses, too. Yeah, sure. Them's fine horses. I paint the engine's riding's almost as fast as a masked man's stallion. I figured on claiming him for myself. Don't be a fool. You're putting your neck in a hang loose by riding that horse. I reckon there ain't a lawman in these parts who don't know it belongs to the Lone Ranger sidekick. Jeff's horse is too well known around here to meddle with, too. Reckon you're right. Whip up them horses. Run them into the sink. Well, you low down skunks, you can't. Shut up! <laughs> That's it, boys. Crowd them two in the quicksand. There they go. <laughs> They're plumb in the center of the days. Yeah. Them horses are in almost up to their knees. They're safe till they sink. Meanwhile, they'll decoy the Lone Range into a death trap. Fan out behind them boulders, boys. As the outlaws concealed themselves, the soft, oozing mire of the quicksand gripped the horses of Tonto and Jeff Hollins even more firmly. Slowly but surely, the bog reached their knees, strained as the two horses would to release themselves and their riders from the prairie's most horrible death. Then, suddenly, the renegades heard a shot and saw the masked figure of the Lone Ranger sitting astride silver on a rocky slope above them, his six guns smoking. He's tricked us, Ace. Tell him, boys. Tell him down. We can't take cover. Yeah, we're right in his line of fire. He can get us whenever he wants. I tell it, boys. Head for the hideout. Yeah, there's one thing, Flint. He's too late to save his friends. Yeah, they're in too deep. Get up there, horse. Get up there, boy. Get up there. Oh, who's over? Oh, my foe. There's still a chance. What you do? I can loop the horn of your saddle with this rope. Silver may be able to pull you out. Ah, uh, he it. It's a long train. It's our only one. Here goes. Ah, uh, you loop saddle horn. Let's hope the rope is strong enough. Ah, uh, it's got to be strong enough. Pull, Silver. Straining against the rope, which the Lone Ranger hooked around his own saddle horn, the great horse Silver struggled to drag Scout and Tonto free of the quicksand which held them. After many tense moments, during which it seemed the rope might snap, the Indian and Jeff Hollins saw that the quick stand was yielding. The muscular stallion's powerful efforts were pulling Tonto and Scout across the bog to firm footing. Good boy, Silver. Uh, give him out, Scout. Come on, big fella. Silver trotted back. Scout scrambled to firm footing, carrying Tonto with him. Then the Lone Ranger spun his lariat again and expertly looped it about the horn of Jeff Hollins' saddle. Tonto's rope followed suit, for the rancher and his horse had sunk deep into the treacherous mire. It took the combined strength of both Silver and Scout to overcome the resistance of the quicksand. Come on, Silver. Get him up, Scout. Hurry, I'm sinking fast. Pull, Silver. Hurry, Scout. That's it. I'm pulling free. Pull hard, Silver. Scout, pull free. That does it. You pulled me clear. <laughs> That afternoon, the Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Jeff reined in their horses on the bank of a stream, not far from a steep cliff, latticed with scrubs and vines. They dismounted and peered intently at the ground. The outlaws' tracks end at the edge of this clearing. Ah. Then they vanish completely. Just like them cow tracks end at the water's edge. We need a trace of them from then on. The solution to the mystery is somewhere near this cliff. Maybe cliff, no answer. Perhaps if we... What in thunder is that? Sound come from cliff. Hide the horses behind this brush. Ah. Suffering snakes. Them renegades are raising a door right out of the cliff wall. Yes, the door is cleverly disguised with scrub and vines to resemble the rest of the wall. 
No wonder you never noticed it, Jeff. Ah, them lift door and pulleys. Look, the door hides the mouth of a tunnel. That may be how rustlers escape with cattle. It seems that way. Some of the gang are coming out. What in tarnation are they doing? Ah, you look there. Them unroll tarpaulin. I see. Oh, that tarpaulin must be 50 feet. Long enough to reach from the tunnel to the water's edge. That reason tracks end at water and clearing. Yes. By driving the cattle and their horses over it, they were able to conceal the fact that their tracks led to the cliff. Where are the ornery crooks? You've seen how the door is open, Jeff. You're darn tootin' I have. Ride to town. Get the sheriff to lead a posse against the rustlers. <laughs> you two stay in here? Until nightfall. Then we'll go after Peggy and Dan. I'll be back with enough men to blast that hole wide open. Get up, horse. the shadows of night settled over the clearing, the Lone Ranger and Tonto stealthily crept toward the cliff. Suddenly, they heard the sound of the tunnel door being raised, saw a patch of light from the interior of the corridor, and the tarpaulin unfold. Hugging the wall in the murky darkness outside the circle of light, they listened as the night raiders conversed about the new cattle thief they were about to stage on Jeff Holland's herd. Then, waiting while the outlaws crossed the stream, and with Ace in their lead, disappeared into the night... The masked man and the Indian crept toward the secret panel. Meanwhile, inside the tunnel, Flint taunted Peggy with her father's death. You're lying. <laughs> don't you wish I was? I don't believe him, Peggy. The Lone Ranger wouldn't let anything happen to your dad. <sighs> he couldn't stop his redskin sidekick from swallowing quicksand. Tonto? Well, I don't believe it. <laughs> Do it yourself, sonny. Well, Tonto isn't, Daddy. It can't be. Yeah, both of them. So I'm sinking in that muck with my own eyes. He's lying, Dan. Oh, I thought I knew how low you could go, Flint, but this beats everything I've imagined. Button your lip. I don't care if it did leave him mired in quicksand. If the Lone Ranger would find a way to get him out, I know he would. Believe it. Oh, is coming back. Lift your hands, Flint. It's the Lone Ranger. Yeah. You heard me. Me get him. Oh, Tonto. I, I knew you were alive. I, I knew it. It's quicksand. Drop your gun belt to the floor. Oh, sure, I'll, I'll drop it. Don't reach for that gun. Don't. Oh. Oh, you'd like to broke my hand. Here's my rope, Tonto. Tie him up. Are you all right, Peggy? Oh, yes, I'm all right, but Dad... How... Your father's safe. Oh, You'll see him soon. Thank goodness. Uh, me finish. Good. Now we'll leave Flint and do a little exploring. Some time later, that Flint, straining at the rope which bound him, heard the return of the rustlers with the stolen trapper. Mm, that's the boys coming now. As soon as they cut me loose from this hand, we'll finish that nice coyote proper and pull it. Hurry up, boys! We gotta work fast. Turn that steers down the tunnel. Ace! Flint, what's happened? Where's Peggy and the kid? Lone Ranger's been here. Lone, get me out of this hand. Yeah, hurry. Hey, who's that? Ain't it all, boys? No, they're herding steers through the tunnel. Right for the tunnel, man. Hey, that sounds like a deer. And a posse. Come on, let's get out of here. We can't go this way. The sheriff will nab us. We'll have to follow the steers to the other end of the tunnel. They've cut off the other end of the tunnel, too. Yeah, somebody's stampeding the steers back this way. Come on, Silver. Where's the big fellow? It's him, the Lone Ranger. We'll have to hightail it out of this. Come on. Come on, me, man. Don't let that boss take. Too late, Flint. We're surrounded. You're down in tooth yard. You're under arrest, Ace. Your whole gang with you. Let me get my hands on Flint. No, no, no. Don't let him hit me, Sheriff. you got to protect me. Take this and double crossing step. Oh. oh, Dad. Dad, are you all right? Of course I'm all right, Peggy. What about you? Oh, Dad, everything's all right. Thanks to the Lone Ranger. Thank you.
you have just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. Calling you on your happy-go-lucky way. Well, if it's me, it feels so happy-go-lucky. Pardon me while I skip a kiss to say. Heaven bless this happy-go-lucky day. Well, Dana. Thank you, Truman. I'm sure all of you listening tonight at one time or another has heard a strain of a melody that sounded so familiar that you said to yourself, I've heard that song before, even though you were hearing it for the first time. Listening to it, you immediately began to associate it with someone or someplace. A high school crush or a graduation dance, maybe. Two songwriters recently recognized that it was a universal weakness and wrote the song I'm going to sing next. It seems to me I've heard that song before It's from an old familiar score I know it well, that melody It's funny how a thing Recalls a favorite dream A dream that brought you so close to me I know each word Because I've heard that song before The lyrics said forevermore Forevermore is a memory. Please have them play it again. And I'll remember just when I heard that lovely Because I've heard that song before The lyric said forevermore Forevermore a memory Please have them play it again And I Remember just when I heard that lovely song before. Gladys, oh Gladys. Yes, Miss Ben Ann, I'm here in the kitchen. Gladys, I I know it's kind of late to ask, but do you think you could make just a couple of sandwiches for me? You see, Mr. Hardy is outside in the living room. Well, my heavens, why didn't you ask me to make them in the afternoon? They'd still be fresh in the evening. Well, I would have, only I didn't know he was coming tonight. He just happened to drop in. Land sakes alive, he just happened to drop in. That don't make no sense, Miss Ben, and you know it. How can anyone just have them to drop in? <laughs> Every night. <laughs> well, the only explanation I can think of is that Mr. Hardy must find Betty Ann just about tops. And funny, though you can't see her, I'll bet you know why. Because Betty Ann's attractive and appealing and dainty. A girl who prides herself on her daintiness, who knows that to win steadfast admiration, she must never, never take chances with her charm. That's why, like so many popular girls, she follows this sure way, the mum way to banish undaintiness. That's M-U-M, mum, the famous snowy white underarm deodorant cream. Why don't you try mum? You see, mum really safeguards the daintiness your bath gives you. Your bath does take care of the past, but then mum protects your daintiness in the hours ahead. 
You can apply mum at any time after you're dressed, if you like. It takes only 30 seconds, but it gives you the sure, dependable protection you need all day long, all evening. And all the time, mum is safe. It does not irritate your skin, does not harm the fabric of your daintiest dress. So next time you're at the drugstore, make sure you ask for mum. And discover for yourself this famous sure way, this quick, safe way to keep dainty, the mum way. Hey, True, did you hear that plan? Well, yes, Donna, I hear that plan. Well, do you know who's plan? No, who is that plan? Why, it's Gabriel, Gabriel plan, Gabriel, Gabriel said. Will you be ready to go when I blow my horn? Oh, blow, Gabriel, blow. Go on and blow, Gabriel, blow. I've been a sinner, I've been a scamp, but now I'm ready to trim my lamp. So blow, Gabriel, blow. I was low, Gabriel, low. Mighty low, Gabriel, low. But now since I have seen the light, I'm good by day and I'm good by night. So blow, Gabriel, low. Once I was headed below. Once I was headed below. But when I got to Satan's door, I heard you blowing on your horn once more. So I said, Satan, farewell. And now I'm all ready to fly. Yes, to fly higher and higher and higher. As I've gone through the brimstone and I've been through the fire. And I've purged my soul and my heart too. So climb up the mountaintop and start to blow, Gabriel, blow. Go on and blow, Gabriel, blow. I want to join your happy band and play all day in the promised land. So blow, Gabriel. And in service, Dinah's mail call, bringing you a medley of memory songs requested by the girls you left back home. Carry the mail, Dinah. Well, the last song in the medley is a memory song nearly everyone's sure to remember. This can't be love. And the second song is especially dedicated to the parachute battalion at Fort Benning, Georgia. Incidentally, thanks, fellas, for naming me your lady of the silk. For you and all other parachute troopers everywhere, I'll sing I'm getting tired so I can sleep. And the first song in the medley is a request from the girls who've been left behind in two wars. They were the sweethearts and wives of the first American soldiers to fight overseas. And they're the mothers of today's soldiers and sailors and marines. The song they particularly requested is one from the last war. Just a baby's prayer at twilight When nights are low Oh, baby's years are filled with tears. There's a mother there at twilight who's proud to know her precious. Little time is dead, forget me not after saying good night, Mama. She climbs the stairs quite unaware. And says her prayers Oh, kindly tell my daddy That he must take care That 
That's a baby's prayer at twilight For her daddy over there I'm getting tired so I can sleep I want to sleep so I can dream I want a dream so I can be with you I've got your picture by my bed Will soon be placed beneath my head To keep me company the whole night through For a little while, whatever befalls I will see you smile till Reveille calls I hope you're tired enough to sleep And please sleep long enough to dream And look for me for I'll be dreaming too This can't be love because I feel so well No sobs, no sorrows, no sighs This can't be love, I get no dizzy spell My head is not in the sky My heart does not stand still Just hear it beat This is too sweet to be love This can't be love because I feel so well But still I love to look in your eyes Dinah saying good night until next week to all you fellas in the service from us girls at home. Night, girls. Night, fellas. Night, everybody. Remember, next week at this same time, in person, Dinah Shore, same station. And won't you also remember, ladies and gentlemen, to make mum your word for charm? Get a jar of mum. That's M-U-M, mum, from your druggist tomorrow. Truman Bradley speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the Blue Network. This is KECA Los Angeles. There's the good old information please rooster asking you to wake up America. It's time to stump the experts. Tonight, the H.J. Hines Company, makers of the famous 57 varieties, welcomes the no less famous information please brainstormers. This is the first Information Please play party to take place under the Heinz sponsorship. Now, those of you who don't know how this play party works, listen carefully. There's a quartet of experts here, ready and willing and even able, sometimes, to answer your questions. You send us your puzzlers. If one is used, the H.J. Heinz Company will gladly give you $10 in war stamps, plus a set of the 12-volume Junior Encyclopedia. Got that? Now, if the experts can't answer your question... You get $57 of war bonds and stamps, plus a 24-volume set of the regular Encyclopedia Britannica. If you got any more than that, you'd have to set up house in Grand Central Station. Send your questions to Information, Please, at 570 Lexington Avenue, New York City. We may change them around a bit, and in case of similarity, you'll have to accept our judgment of who shall be paid. All questions remain our property. Information, Please, is presented under the supervision of Dan Golanpaul. And now, the House of 57 Varieties opens its doors to our Master of Ceremonies, book reviewer of the New Yorker magazine, Clifton Fadiman. Thanks, Ben Brower. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our coming out party under the sign of the H.J. Hines Company. And naturally, we're all a little nervous, as well as more than a little delighted. Tonight, to add to the famous 57 varieties, we have four odd varieties of our own the Information Please panel of experts. 
First, our regulars. Our encyclopedic, Sarah Brader, conductor of the column, One Small Voice, the inexhaustible John Curran. <laughs> Second, our musical prodigy, the pianist and composer, America's foremost problem child, the unpredictable Oscar Levant. Third, our Dean of Information Pleasers, the unparalleled Franklin P. Adams. And finally, our guest, the star of the Star Theater, which you may hear every Sunday night, Mr. Fred Allen. Now, bright as Mr. Allen is, we figure we can exhaust his knowledge in about 20 minutes. And so we've arranged that later on in the program, Mr. Allen himself will become the master of ceremonies, and I will join my colleagues at the experts' table. Now I want to remind old listeners and inform new ones that this is a completely unrehearsed, spontaneous program, a catch-as-catch-can affair, no holds barred, and our first challenge comes from Patricia Charles of Forest Hills, New York. We have to get all on these gentlemen. It's a three-part question. What is each of the following? And each of the following has the word short in it. The first is short suit. What's a short suit? Mr. Levant. It's bridge. And what does it mean? I don't play bridge. <laughs> well, that gives us about 10% on that answer. Mr. Kieran? Well, a short suit uh, in bridge would be uh, one in which, of which you had no holding cards at all, or you might have one or two. A two would be a real short suit out of 13 cards. You have two clubs or two diamonds, whatever it is. And you make a bid uh, in corresponding with your holding in a short suit, provided you have other things to make up for it, as, for instance, length and trunk. Is that okay, Fred? As far as I'm concerned, I don't know. I have short arms. I don't play cards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's the perfect answer. Now, how about a short snorter, gentlemen? What's a short snorter, Mr. Allen? A short snorter is, is uh, some association that uh, exists among pilots, people who fly on planes. You're I'm on. a short snorter, but I was made one in a hurry. In, in the That's incorrect. Fitness. Oh, he's right so far. Well, it isn't pilots. It's traveling uh, across pilots the ocean. Pilots, too. Yeah, well, what does it mean exactly, Mr. Levant? Any of these transoceanic flights, uh, oh. they must buy a drink, and then everybody autographs a dollar bill. They must not lose this dollar bill upon request of any other member... If it's lost, they must buy another round of drinks. Well, I didn't cross the ocean. I got mine coming from Minneapolis to Chicago. We didn't cross any water. And there was nothing to drink on the plane, and I have a dollar with everyone's name on it, and I'm a short snorter, and I doubt if Mr. Levant is a short snorter. Uh, <laughs> you Mr. better look Levant? that bill No, but he's friend. not a pilot. He said it was well, a I'm a yes. short snorter. You, don't have to, you just have to be a passenger. Who is uh, one of the most famous of recently made short snorters, Mr. Kieran? Wendell Wilkie. For one. Franklin Wilkie D. Roosevelt. For one. Franklin D. Roosevelt right. for another, yes. Now, what, gentlemen, is a short stout? A short stout, Mr. Kieran? Well, a short stout is, is a measure of clothing. Yes? When a man walks in, well, his suit, well, got his, or a pair of pajamas, or uh, any other article that a man might wear. Yes. Five or by a lady, five. for that matter. Five by five. Short five suit. By five. Yeah. What did you say, Mr. It's Adam? a short suit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that gives us uh, three shorts out of three. Now, how about this one from Mrs. Ruth? Knees of Montclair, New Jersey. Identify the obscure halves of these famous teams. Who rode, for example, with Paul Revere? We hear a lot about Paul Revere, but uh, there was another chap who rode with him, Mr. Adams? William Dawes. William Dawes, yes, and we should remember him. How about uh, someone who served with William Howard Taft? Who was that? What do you mean by serve? Along with him. He's a fat man. I don't know what you mean. Uh, served, as, uh, presumably, as vice president. Who was that? Oh. Mr. Kieran? Uh, was that Fairbanks? James Schoolcraft Sherman. Very right. good, Mr. Sorry. Adams. James? Of Utica, New York. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know him, Frank? No, I read, I read the papers in those days. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the, here's another and final obscure have. Who acts with Mary Livingston? <laughs> Mr. Allen? The obscure have. Yeah. <laughs> would be uh, uh, Jack Benny. Yeah, well, I'll give you three seconds on Jack Benny, if you wish, Mr. Allen. On Jack Benny? Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't even preface what I might want to say about him in three seconds. <laughs> All right. Jack Benny is right, and that gives us three out of three, making one and a half altogether. How about this one from Lou Smith of New York City? Identify the tough pug of the ring whose activities were supervised by this member of the gentler sex. 
For your information, Oscar, that means women. Uh, Fred Simmons is the answer to that one. Now, wait a minute. The question... I, I they... What were you saying, Fred? Well, they don't let you finish the questions. I'm a guest here, and it's the first time the guest hasn't been right because I can't get an answer into the questions. <laughs> he won't let you ask Adam, the question. Adam won't give you a chance. Now, who was supervised, what pugilist was supervised by his mother? Mr. Kieran. Uh, struggling. Young, Young struggling. struggling. Yes, that's right. And also his father. Where's his father? He's not mentioned on this card. They had a trailer. They went all around the country in a trailer, didn't they, John? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how about someone who was sort of managed by his sister? Uh, Mr. Levant. Levinsky, battling Levinsky. Is that the same as Kingfish Levinsky? Kingfish, Kingfish that's right. right. Kingfish is the one. And how Don't about... Don't take a check either name. That's all right. This one ought to be easy to answer. Uh, a pug who is managed by his wife. That's Fifth Simmons. She yeah. said, he said, jab him in the slats. She said, jab him in the slats. <laughs> that right, John? Well, so they say. I wasn't there. Lou Jenkins. Lou Jenkins, I guess. Katie, uh, they're divorced now. Yeah. All right, that gives us three out of three. Now, how about this one from Mrs. Emmett Brown of Rosalia, Kansas? What's the source of these famous American phrases? The first is very short. He's a card. Where does it come from? He's a card. C-A-R-D. Not the uh, baseball, baseball team, team no. no. Mm -hmm. He's a card. Uh, well, I don't Adam. know, but that is uh, usually uh, British. Well, it's American in this case. A card? Yeah, he's a card. It, uh, it's a sentence reiterated in a famous short story by Ring Lardner. What's the short story called? You know me, Al? No. No, Mr. it's a story Kim? where a man is killed. Uh, he's taken out in a boat, I uh, think. Haircut. 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 Haircut, yes. Isn't uh, that the story? Uh, it's about a practical joker yes, who gets people is. into lots of trouble. The man that's... takes him out in a boat and shoots him. I think that's right. That's uh, one wrong. Now we have to get the next two right. Where did the card come in? He's <laughs> a card? Card. That's what the barber oh, says right. about the guy in the story. You don't want me to tell the whole story. No, you, I right? thought it had some significance. It turns out to be... Not a bit. It's boat. just a way of stumping the experts. <laughs> <that's all. laughs> Here's another phrase. He could whip his weight in wildcats. What's that? What's that from? Who said it? Mr. Adams. Uh, Eugene Field. That's right. Very good. What's it from, Mr. Adams? Remember? I think that's from uh, All Them Days on Red Horse Mountain. It's from a, a poem called Majeski as Camille. Majeski as Camille. As Camille. That's the way it begins. That's the way it begins. Very good. Now, that's going back a long way. How about this one? Have you ever been to Cincinnati? I know that. Do you, Mr. The Prince of Pilsen. That's good. I saw it in the light opera comedy. When? When I was a kid, the Aborn Light Opera Company used to come to Pittsburgh. My brother would play there, and I sat in the pit for nothing. <laughs> What's your effort in Cincinnati? That's exactly right. All right. All right, we'll interrupt for a moment while our Heinz reporter, Ben Grauer, uh, in these Information Please programs, brings you tonight vital information to help solve your wartime food problems. But I'd better let him tell you himself. Mr. Grauer. The new sponsor of Information Please, the H.J. Heinz Company, makers of the famous 57 varieties of fine foods, plan to use this program to bring you helpful information on wartime food problems. The latest authoritative news on current food supplies, regulations, and rations. Since 1869, Heinz has supplied quality foods to the nation and has contributed to our American tradition of good eating and for many years offered mealtime planning service to the housewives. Today, when food is a matter of vital importance, we are eager to help answer a few of the many questions that are stumping the experts in our own homes, those busy women who must plan, buy, and prepare the meals that make America strong. And so, each Monday night at this time... When Information Please pays you a visit, we'll try to have some interesting and up-to-the-minute information about the food you eat. Thank you, Mr. Grower. And now we'll go on with a question from Elizabeth Cook of Fall River, Massachusetts. And this is a musical question. I think we ought to get all on it. What doctor would you see for each of the conditions described in the following songs? Let's have the first. got two hands. Uh, Mr. Allen? A dermatologist. Good work. Why? Uh, well, if I had you under my skin, I'd certainly go to somebody right away because it would <laughs> be very uncomfortable, and I would go to a skin specialist That's naturally. Right. You need more than a dermatologist. Unless I was case. a kangaroo, then I'd ignore the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> huh? 
Uh, now the second of these. What doctor would you go to see for this one? Mr. Levant. The orthopedist. Although he wouldn't help me. Oh, don't say that. You give up. In the I have flat feet. He never cured me. He never did? No. Might have been his musical association. His <laughs> feet might have fallen a half a tone on account of all the... No, I think it's hereditary. I mean it. Really? Yeah, I don't Papa, want you to... Mama, uh, Uncle? Well, uh, uh, many... We call it the flat-footed Levance. <laughs> <laughs> and the song that was being played by a pianist was flat -footed, what? Flat-footed Fluji. Flat-footed Fluji. All right, now let's get the next one. Is that your hand, Mr. Allen? A uh, part of it, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure. I only put up part of my hand, if you don't mind. Well, let me have part of the answer. I'm falling in love. I'd see a, a minister or the girl's father. I'd see a psychoanalyst. Well, why, it why would you on... see a psychoanalyst, Mr. I'd see Levin. one without this question. <laughs> <laughs> Soon late. <laughs> Oscar is always plugging his friends. Uh, what was the song called, Oscar? I didn't have part of my hand up. Mr. Allen did. No, but I know, I'd like to know what the song was called. I bet you know he it. He said Falling in Love. I don't know it. That isn't the same as I Don't Want to Get Well, is it? I don't know the song. It's called I Don't Want to Get Well. That's right. And well, the answer is... Uh, psychoanalyst. Yes, a, a psychoanalyst, a psychiatrist. Right. You just guessed that? Oh, that was after Mr. Allen's finger was up. Yes, mm -hmm. when I put it down, he gave me... Yeah, I don't, think I'll give you a, I don't think I'll give you a perfect on that. Well, that neither sends, one of us I knows. think we'll send $57... Note that, 57. 57. Yeah. In war bonds and stamps to Miss Cook and a set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And now here's one from R.H. Casson of Macon, Georgia. I think we ought to get all on this one, too. Complete the line of poetry that includes these phrases. Out of the night, Mr. Kieran? That covers me black as the pit from pole to pole. Yes. In uh, the by Henley. W. Yes. William Ernest Henley. Good enough. Mr. Adams had his hand up, too. And how about this one? Out of the everywhere. Mr. Adams? Where did you come from, baby dear? Out of the everywhere, into the here. That's very nice, Mr. Adams. Question mark. Yes. Who, who wrote it? I don't know. Would you, would you like to know? I'd love to know. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm going to tell you. George McDonald. George McDonald. Now, how about this one? Out of the cradle, Mr. Kieran? Once per morning when the fifth month grass was growing. Uh, uh, out of the end, out of the cradle, endlessly rocking by uh, Walt Whitman. Yes, that's beautiful. So, uh, that's, a, that's a far get. Do you like that? I think the one? racetrack people pronounce it Palmanock. Palmanock. What is it's it? It's a race named after it. What is Palmanock or what part it's, of the country is Palmanock? It's down in Long Island. It is Long Island. And does, doesn't the name mean, isn't it Indian for fish-shaped or something like that? I believe that? it does. Especially a Long Island is shaped something like a large fish. Well, we did get three out of three on that. Now, how about this one? From Mrs. Rose Kaplan of Stafford Springs, Connecticut. Give four slang expressions or colloquialisms that might be used, metaphorically, to heat the house. For example, uh, to put on the heat would be a phrase... With, in which uh, high temperature is involved. Let's see if we can get a few more, Mr. Allen. Get hot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm. Mr. Uh, Kieran. You burn me up. <laughs> yes, that two very good ones. Now we've got the house up to about 64 now. Turn on the steam. Turn on the steam. Turn, Turn on, on the, the heat. Steam. I'm steaming. Uh, yes, get off steam. There are a lot of others. It's pretty hot hard to get cookie. on steam. Hot cookie, yes. Mm. That's good. Mm. Good heating up. How about... Cooking uh, with gas isn't bad. No, that isn't bad. Rake him over the coals. A lot of hot air. Banana oil, maybe any of those. Please. Hot foot. Hot foot, sure. How about this one from uh, Lieutenant F.R. Winter of Asbury Park, New Jersey? How did these numbers figure in recent or current news? First, number 17 until June 15th. Mr. Allen. The 17 uh, is the coupon in your coffee and sugar book that entitles you to three pairs of shoes. And only one. One pair of shoes. Yes, yeah, three pairs in a three year. Three pairs in a year. You only one shoe, as a matter of fact. Okay. Well, that's if you're a monopede, you get one shoe and a half a pound of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> now, what does this mean to you, gentlemen? Forty-eight in 32 areas. Forty-eight in 32 areas. 
Uh, Mr. Allen again. Uh, 48 uh, hour week in 32 right. areas around the country. That's right. The various yes. industries. Yes, what were you going to say, Mr. Adams? Exactly that. Yeah, you just follow Allen. You'll be all right on this show. He Adams. would have worded it better, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how about this one? Number one for 57. Mr. Kieran. This show for the Heinz people. Thank God. Mm -hmm. That's, we're good for another week. <laughs> uh, and now Mr. Grower has a word for us about a man we used to take for granted. Mm -hmm. The man who sells the groceries that grace our dinner tables. Yes, Mr. Fadiman. War means new problems for all of us. But there's one man who has more than his share of headaches, and that is your grocer. He is short of many familiar items, and he's short of help. He will have the equal of your food problems multiplied by the hundreds of customers he serves. Now, over the years, we have known your grocer mighty well. And he's the kind of a man who really deserves your help and consideration. So please plan your marketing carefully. Do your buying early in the day and early in the week. Meanwhile, when it seems as though your grocer is always out of the very item you want, don't blame him. Blame Hitler, Hirohito, and Benito. A smile, a friendly, sympathetic attitude will do wonders in a grocery store nowadays... But just remember, your grocer would much rather sell you all the things you want to buy. It's no fun for him to have to say no. So make this Be Kind to Your Grocer Week. By showing him every courtesy and giving him every break you can, he really deserves it. Thank you, Mr. Grower. And now Fred Allen has done about as much of this program as is possible, acting as an expert. He will complete the job from now on. As MC, and I'll rough things up on the mourner's bench over there with Mr. Kieran, Mr. Adams, and Mr. Levant. Here we go. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fadiman. I know that honoring the, the Heinz uh, company will try to keep things in the pickle as we go from now. I know that many people, uh, I know many people who at one time or another have wished they could inflict corporal punishment on a radio comedian. You are the first person to have the pleasure of giving a comedian the chair, and I hope that you enjoy it. Are you uh, comfortable, Mr. Fadiman? No. You're not comfortable, huh? Well, now, for the first time, I realize what you go through as I sit here and look at the Committee of Experts head-on. I realize what you put up with each it week. Looks just as bad from over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, but I have it multiplied by four. You can imagine what I'm going through. But we'll, uh, we'll try to keep up the fast tempo Mr. Fadiman has set. And our first question comes from Mrs. Ann Smith, Helena, Montana. Gentlemen, I'd like to have you get all of these if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fadiman is making a face at me, but I have a face already made which will outdo anything <laughs> that he can hope to. Now, continue the, the quotations uh, or popular expressions which begin with these words. Remember, we must get all. What quotations? I'm going to sit right down, uh, Mr. Levant. And write myself a letter. That's right. A Mr. love letter. Well, uh, it doesn't say here, just any sort. It uh, seems to be well, suggested... what would you do? Well, I think... I'll sit right down and write myself a letter. I would think it would be suggested by a man who was on a draft board and saw his own number coming up. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my impression. The second is, peace sit you down. What? Peace sit you down. Peace? Peace? Yes, continue the quotation. Peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, sit you down. And pass the ammunition? No. Mm. This is peace, sit you down. It's not what Father Divine says before dinner. It's, <laughs> it's another... Is it from Macbeth? No, uh, that's close, Mr. Fadiman, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> you have the right author, but the wrong work. I know, it's Shakespeare. It's Shakespeare. <laughs> Mr. Adams... Uh... Don't know. Well, uh, all right. Then the third, uh, the third is sit down. Sit down. Uh, Mr. Levant. You're rocking the boat. Uh, exactly, Mr. Levant. That's Macbeth. Great. Macbeth. No, we only get that. Uh, do, uh, do you please sit down? Would you like to have another go at that, Mr. Kieran? No, I don't want no. any part of it. You give uh, your pardon? Let's peace the, lie down. No, peace sit you down and let me wring your heart, for so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff. It's oh, Hamlet that's to hard. Gertrude. That's hard. That's too hard. Well, I know. I, I didn't... Miss we you. never say that to you. Well, I know, but <laughs> I'm not saying it to you only uh, uh, in behalf of Mrs. Ann Smith of Helena, Montana, who probably wanted to get the question out of town, as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> sit down. Sit down. 
sit down might have been uh, what we lose on that, don't we? And so then we send Mrs. Ann Smith of Helena, Montana, $57 from the Heinz people, a, a war bond. Isn't it a war bond and stamps? $57. And a full set of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which Mr. Adams, FPA, will deliver personally tomorrow morning. <laughs> now, our next question from Phyllis Colbert, Chicago, Illinois. We'd like to have you get two out of three. What characters of literature make these transitions? What character is hit on the head with a crowbar in a democracy and finds himself in a feudal society? Uh, Mr. Fadiman. Fellow in Mark Twain's uh, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. That's right. This job is easy. Uh, well, you haven't identified the man. You just, uh, some fellow. There were fellow two or three fellows uh, in the... Had a Yankee name. Uh... Very good Yankee name. Hank. Two uh, syllables. Will Rogers did it in the picture. Well, I know, but before... It had to be written before Mr. Rogers did it. Well, uh, Mr. Fadiman is correct. It's Hank Morgan in a Connecticut Yankee by Mark Twain. Good work. Could a man be hit on the head with a crowbar in a democracy these days? Easily. Can do it Not out of the comic strips. Not out of the comic strips. <laughs> I, I doubt it, because if the crowbar owner had given the bar in and the scrap drive, there'd be nothing to hit him with. The second part is... What character takes a strong drink in a monarchy and wakes up in a republic? Takes a strong drink in a monarchy. Mr. Adams? Rip Van W. Winkle. That is correct. Did you know what strong drink Mr. Van Winkle took? It was supposed to be ale, which addled his poor head sadly. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, what character... That shuts me up, incidentally. <laughs> What character falls into a hypnotic sleep in a capitalist society and awakes in a socialist commonwealth? Uh, Mr. Fadiman. The main, the hero in Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy, I think. Julian West, that's correct. That's two out of three. And we pass on to our next question, a rather simple question from Fred Allen, New York City. <laughs> <laughs> now, here are some passages from a group of great thinkers. Who are they? This is an easy question, so you have to answer all three parts, what gentlemen. What was that again, Fred? I didn't hear it. The, the question... That, well, I haven't come to the question yet. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the question is so easy, I will allow you three seconds for each answer. Now, the first, should the nebula hypothesis ever be established, then it will become manifest that the universe at large, like every organism, was once homogeneous. <laughs> Mr. Levant. The Rommel plan. <laughs> That's close, but it's not the right answer. Mr. Uh, Kieran? Is that on the level? Yes, this is on the level. I see we don't know it, gentlemen. It comes from Herbert Spencer. It's in social statistics. Now, the second part... The second part of our question, there is therefore no way of avoiding the conclusion that the pure conceptions of understanding can never be employed transcendentally, but only empirically and that the principles of pure understanding can apply only to objects of sense. Now, what great thinker. Mr. Fadiman? Might be Kant. That is correct, from the critique of pure reason. <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> and, uh, Mr. Adams, did you have something to add? That's just what I was going to say. I took the words out of my you mouth. wouldn't want to take it apart and explain any part of it, would you? <laughs> the third part is this essential being is the union of the subjective with the rational will. It is the moral whole, the state which is that form of actuality in which the individual has and enjoys his freedom. Mr. Fadiman. See the Aristotle of Spinoza. No. Tom I'm... Paine. No. You're a gag writer. No. <laughs> it might have been. I have one name. I don't know. It could be, uh, Mr. Is Kent. that one of the James boys? Uh, no. Jesse? No. No, this is... Uh, Darwin. No. Pardon? Darwin. Not Darwin, no. I give up. Goldwyn. Goldwyn. Goldwyn and Darwin, they're not the same, <laughs> are they? <laughs> but the, uh, this is uh, by Hegel uh, from the Philosophy of History. And so, gentlemen, I've always wanted an encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight we send an encyclopedia to Fred Allen, care of the Texaco Star Theater. Now, our next question... <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I won't want the $57. You can give that to some charity, if you will. And charity begins at home, and Mr. Levant knows where I live. <laughs> <laughs> now, from Charles E. Barton, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, two out of three gentlemen. What contemporary writer characterized a woman or women in his books as a mouse? What, uh... Eddie Cannon. No. Contemporary writer? Contemporary writer. Shakespeare did. As a mouse? Disney. Sure, he says, sweep my mouse of virtue. No. Disney. Uh, Mr. Adams? Damon Runyon. 
Not Damon Runyon. Mark Hollinger. Mark, no. Disney. Not Disney. He might have done it with ink. This man did it with a typewriter. It's, uh, it's in Pal Joey. That's right. That's well, right. John O'Hara. John O'Hara. Yeah. Refers to a woman as a mouse. What the contemporary writer uh, characterizes a woman as a uh, rabbit? Thoro. Some single man. What doesn't? Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, you missed it by a hair, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> of which you haven't any too many, Mr. Adams. <clears throat> Rabbit. You give up? Give yeah. up. Give up. All right. Ernest Hemingway and For Whom the Bell Tolls. Now, the next what contemporary writer characterizes woman as a turtle dove? This even fool. Oh, W.C. Fields. W.C. Fields yeah. is right. And what work, Mr. Levant? What book of his? Uh, the Bank Deck, which is not a work. Oh, the bank thing. <laughs> Not a work of art. No, the one, uh, the one with that uh, nice... Well, that was a picture. Lady. That yeah. wasn't a book. So uh, we have uh, one minute. Will I have time to start this next one, do you think? Yeah. Uh, what did we do on that? Did we get two out of three? We didn't get two out of three. We missed... We missed... Uh, we got one out of three. And so a uh, $57 in war bonds, I'll bring back <laughs> prosperity if I stay on here. <laughs> goes to Mr. Charles E. Barton of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and a set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, from J.J. Bartholomew Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, two out of three. What happens to the heroines of these complicated love stories? Helena loves Demetrius, who loves Hermia, who loves Lysander. Mr. Kieran. Why, it all gets straightened out. That's, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare. That is correct. Now, Constantine loves Kitty, who loves Alexa, who loves Anna. Is that Anna Karan? That is correct. Anna Karan. Uh, Elliot has married Sybil, though he still loves Amanda, who has married Victor. Private Lars. That is correct. Victor that Coward. No Coward. Yeah. No Coward's play. And the other was Tolstoy's Anna Karina. Anna commits suicide at the end of the book. Previously, she had run off with Alexei Vronsky. I got to interrupt, Fred, because Thank that's you. about all we'll have time for. We got through our first play party at the House of 57 Varieties with a net loss of Allen. Good heaven. <laughs> Net loss of $228 in war bonds and stamps and four sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, uh, Mr. Allen, no one can say that you didn't and I didn't uh, do your and our share tonight to help the Treasury Department. Now, next week, the H.J. Hines Company has arranged for Mr. Adams and Mr. Kieran to strut their stuff. And as guests, we've invited our old friend, the author of Thoroughfare, the famous novelist Christopher Morley. Plus, an extra special attraction, our good friend Gregory Ratoff. Mr. Ratoff was invited to come east and be with us, but he's up to his waistline in his new MGM picture, Russia. And so we've arranged for him to be our guest by remote control from Hollywood. Next week, we'll hear from Mr. Ratoff in California, where he'll signal us by a bell in his own studio with his own audience. Remember, send your questions with the correct answers to information, please, at 570 Lexington Avenue, New York City. Adventures of Jungle Jim. The Adventures of Jungle Jim broadcast weekly over this station are dramatized from the full color action pictures to be found in the Comic Weekly, the world's greatest comic supplement that comes to you each week with your Hearst Sunday newspaper. Join the 11 million adults and the 6 million youngsters who enjoy the world's best artists featured in every issue of the Comic Weekly which comes to you with your Hearst Sunday newspaper. Jim, heading for the Orient aboard the SS Albatross, accidentally runs into a family quarrel between a Mr. and Mrs. O'Neill. However, it develops into much more than just a spat between husband and wife, as Mrs. O'Neill unburdens herself to Jim with a story of intrigue and espionage as weird as any he ever heard of. Her husband proves to be Hacker O'Neill in the employ of one of the Axis powers and is planning to give away the position of the blacked-out albatross just to accomplish a fitting revenge on Jungle Jim and also to get rid of a wife of whom he seems to have tired. As he starts to flash a signal from the upper deck, Jim lands him in a heap by a flying tackle. Just keep your hands in the air for a few minutes. It'll be healthier for you. You've seen too many Wild West pictures, mister. Come on, stop this horse, but I've got other things to do. Things like signaling with a flashlight to whoever may be out there in the darkness? You got me all wrong. Here, take the flashlight and let me alone. I've got to get out of here. You've got to go nowhere. We're going to the captain, and he'll decide what you can and cannot do for the balance of this voyage. Look here, Bradley, that's a waste of time. 
Maybe we ain't got too much time left for such nonsense. What do you mean? I've got plenty of time, all day and night if necessary. That's what you think. Look here, Bradley, can't we make some sort of a deal? I'm not without means, and I'd be willing to pay a a handsome sum to keep this thing just between us. You know, publicity and such can't do anyone any good. Well, that's something else again. Now, uh, what would you consider handsome? Uh, Now, don't get me wrong. I'm just sort of uh, mildly interested, should we say. Well, I can be discreet, too, but if you don't look like the sort of a fellow to bargain with, I'll name one price. It's worth a thousand dollars to me for you to forget the whole matter and drop it at once. It's not a bad figure. I knew you'd be sensible, and then I saw you. It's a deal. Well, not quite. Now, what's the matter? There are certain things you don't buy and sell, you dirty spying crook. And it's about time you found it out. And liberty is one of them. In fact, I'm going to make it my business to see that you haven't much of that for a long time to come. So you're going to turn me and you double cross it? <coughs> keep a civil tongue in your head, you rat. Don't hit me. Don't hit me. I'll keep quiet. Yes, and keep going, too. Don't stop till we reach the captain's quarters. And I'll just keep your own gun in your back till we arrive. Now, come on, get going. Keep on this course for another two hours. We should be well out of the danger zone, Mr. Curtis. Yes, sir, Captain. Uh, Sir, why don't you try to get some rest? Seventy-two hours. It's enough for anyone to try to stick to such a nerve-wracking post. We'll be all right, sir. Well, we haven't much more to go. I'll let you relieve me in an hour. If you say so, sir, but I'd rather do it now. Well, thanks, Curtis. I'll not forget this, but I think my place is here. We're running at a dangerous speed without lights. I'd feel better if the Navy had seen fit to give us some sort of a patrol. Well, if it'll make you feel better, we're picking one up at Panama. Who's there? Bradley, a passenger, sir. Open the door, Mr. Curtis. I'll kill the light. Yes, sir. Come in. Careful there. No lights. I have another passenger with me. Come on in, will you? Light, sir. What's the meaning of this? Passengers don't carry firearms aboard my ship? Put that gun down. Here are my credentials, Captain. Naval intelligence. And the gun belongs to this fellow. I took it away from him. James Bradley. Now, who is this man? A passenger, sir, named O'Neill, whom I believe was trying to contact an enemy submarine by means of flashlight signals on the port rail of A-deck. That's what I caught him doing. Put that man in irons, Mr. Curtis. This is all a big mistake, Captain. This fellow Bradley seems to be a bit touched on the subject of spies. No one said anything about spies, O'Neill. Why do you bring it up? And if this is of no importance, maybe you'd like to repeat your offer of a few moments ago. Captain, he offered me a bribe of $1,000 to forget the whole incident. When a fellow's got a gun in your ribs, you're liable to say anything, Captain. Well, that's what he said, sir. And I'm sure he knew exactly what he was talking about. Put your hands out. You can't do this to me. I'm not a common criminal. You can accuse me of anything, but proving it is another matter. Any man is supposed to be innocent until he's proved otherwise. That's the law. And the law gives me the power to exercise my judgment in the behalf of the ship and passengers in my care. Put the irons on him, Mr. Curtis. Put those hands out. I'm doing this under protest. I don't care how you do it. Get him out. Mr. Bradley, congratulations on your patience. I believe I'd have kicked him overboard if I caught him doing what you accused him of. The brig, sir? Yes, I think it'd be the safest place. And, Mr. Bradley? Yes? I expect your cooperation in pressing charges when we arrive at port. When we arrive at port? That's a laugh! You'll never arrive! Take him out of here, Mr. Curtis, or I'll remove those irons myself and teach that lout some manners. He'll be in the brig, sir. That was a torpedo. Stand by. We may have to abandon ship. Take these bracelets off me! Get out of my way or I'll kick you! I can't swim with these irons! Isn't that too bad? Try to keep an eye on this man. If there's room in any one of the boats, rescue him. I'd like to see him hung. Aye, aye, sir. Come in. Drop in on the port bar, sir. Engine room is flooded. She's high for the stern, sir. Get a message off, Sparks. Okay, SOS. Sir. All right. Lifeboat station. Lifeboat station. Boat number three. This way to boat number three. Oh, dear me, what uh, happened? There's nothing to be excited about, lady. Everything will be all right. Just keep calm. I should have stayed home like Harry wanted me to. Put that life preserver on. It'll do you no good to carry it. Hi there. Fox, are you all right? Yes, sir. But that hit carried away the antenna. Didn't have a chance to send the first signal. Try to rig up some kind of a portable. Yes, sir. What's your boat station, madam? I don't remember. Come on, I'll find one for you. Oh, will we be safe? Yes, I think so, madam. Have you got a coat? Well, 
Why, oh, sure, down in my stateroom. I'll go get it. No, here, take mine. Oh, thank you. You'll need it. Here, here, you. Take care of this lady. Right, I said, come on, lady, this way. That dirty swine. They not only torpedo me, but now shell us. At point blank range, you inhuman devils. Charge over there, boys. Captain, I'm taking water fast. Can't last more than a few minutes, and the list won't let us launch the boats. Well, see if you can throw some of the rafts from that side. Ha! There go the lights. I'll see if the engineer can switch the battery, sir. Yeah, go ahead. How are the passengers behaving? Good as can be expected, sir. No trouble yet, sir. Fine. Perfect. Cross over to the port. Don't crowd. There's plenty of room for everyone. Jimmy! Take her. Jimmy! 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 Mrs. O'Neill! Mrs. O'Neill! Oh, what is it? What's up? Oh, who's there? Open the door! Come on, get up. We've been hit by a torpedo. Oh. oh, I thought I heard something, but I was so fast asleep. Listen, girl, hurry up. Why, you could sleep through the sound of Gabriel's horn. Oh, I'll be right with you. But where's Hacker? I don't know, and I don't care either. You're the only one I'm thinking about now. Come on, we've only got a few minutes. Here you are, lady. Here you are. One more place in this boat. Come on, Jim. There's always room for one more. Oh, never mind me. You go ahead. Come on, lady. Get aboard. Come on, lady. Come on. Get in there, madam. Come on. There goes the last light, boat, sir. There's plenty of passengers left aboard, sir. Well, get preservers on them and tell them to get overboard. It's their only chance. Aye, aye, sir. How's the crew behaving? Get overboard there. How's that crew behaving? sir. Right up the scratch, sir. Try to throw everything overboard. That'll float, too. That'll help a little... Madam, you can't stay here any longer. Now, go on. Get down there. The order to abandon ship has been given. Jimmy! Can I help? Yeah, get this woman overboard while there's still time. All right, come on, lady. We'll find you, Jimmy. He's not on board. Can you swim? Yes, sure. All right, then. Come on. We'll jump together. How you doing? All right? I'm fine, but Jimmy... Here. Here's a cabinet. Just hold on here. We'll try to get you picked up by one of the boats. Oh. Hold my hand. Hold my hand, darling. Good job of it. They shelled every boat and raft that was afloat. Yeah. Guess the only reason we were spared was that they couldn't find us. I think we're the only two. You see any signs of anyone else? Not since dawn. There were a lot of voices near me during the night, but not one since the sun came up. Well, we can last about a day in the sun. But that's all. Well, uh, a lot can happen in a day. Yeah. She could go mad with thirst. Now, look. Don't think about it. How about lasting yourself to this bar? There's some rope at that end. Might as well. Yeah. Save some strength, but I don't know for what. Hey! Oh, let go! What are you... What's the matter? Ah! Curtis! Curtis! Water's getting red. Only one thing could do that. A shark. Don't miss the next exciting episode of the adventures of Jungle Jim. Remember, you can follow these adventures in the full-color action pictures to be found in the Comic Weekly, which comes to you with your Hearst Sunday newspaper. And now, a very special announcement. Listen closely. Avenge Pearl Harbor, Manila, and Wake Island. Here is how you can do your part to strike a vigorous blow at our treacherous enemies. 
Join the campaign to buy a bomber. To have a part in this stirring effort for your country, put your contributions, no matter how large or small, in an envelope and mail it at once to the Buy a Bomber Fund in care of the Sunday newspaper that brings you your comic weekly. Join the hundreds of thousands of patriotic citizens who have started a flood of dimes and dollars to buy a bomber and avenge Pearl Harbor, Manila, and Wake Island. Do your bit today. Remember, an average of only a few dimes from each reader will raise the $300,000 necessary to buy a bomber for Uncle Sam. Remember to send your contributions, large or small, to the Buy a Bomber Fund in care of your Sunday newspaper that brings you the Comic Weekly. Star Parade, starring Harry James and his orchestra. Hello, everyone. This is Harry James, greeting you with another program in the feature series of weekly broadcast presented by the United States Treasury. And our first number, ladies and gentlemen, is dedicated to the fighting men in our armed forces, and it's our military medley.
a tune that goes with your 10% treasury button. Helen Forrest sings, I Don't Want to Walk Without You, Baby. for one of the current hit tunes of the day, Jimmy Saunders sings One Dozen Roses. Send them to the one I love She'll be glad to receive them And I know she'll believe them That's something we've been talking of There may be orange blossoms later Kind of think that there will Cause she's done something to me And my heart won't keep still Give me one dozen roses Put my heart in beside them And send them to the one I love
Thank you, Jimmy Saunders, for one dozen roaches. And now for those of you who like your music in a jump groove, here's the two o'clock jump. James for a wonderful performance. Well, Mr. Douglas, working for the United States Treasury is a real privilege and honor. All of us on the home front have a big job ahead supporting America's war efforts. It's up to each one of us to see that our boys on the battlefront get the weapons they need to defend America and defeat the Nazis and Japs. We can do this by investing at least 10% of our income in United States war savings bonds and stamps every week or every payday. When you buy war bonds and stamps, you are investing in the future security of America. Right you are, Harry James. Join the War Bond 10% Club by pledging $1 out of every 10 you receive for war bonds and stamps. Display the red, white, and blue window sticker and wear the War Bond 10% Club button. Remember, our president... USA, the greatest entertainers in America, is requested by you, the service men and women of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. Command performance presented this week and every week till it's over, over there. Okay there, gang, you 
placed your bets on command performance. To answer your letters, Care of Armed Forces Radio, Los Angeles, USA. So let's get up to that window marked America and collect. The joint's full of singing cashiers. And stepping up first to pay off with when they ask about you, here's one of your top money favorites and boss woman in the mail department tonight, that globe-trotting girlfriend of the AEF, Frances Langford. about you What's the good if I say that you and I are through I tell them you're okay when they ask about you They wonder where This is Francis, making a few long-distance calls. Love to 726 and Legs, Tangle, Simp, and Meat Nose. Ditto to you Ordnance Grease Monkeys, Goldie, Tex, Foxy, Bill, Spud, and Minnesota John, better known as Moldy. At 764, hello to Lippy Klein, Partiality Lee, Pee Wee Ball, Oblong Giles, Horizontal Clayball, and <laughs> Bubble Tummy Anderson. And skipping 512 way, love to Little Beaver, Big Beaver, Clem, Jenny, and Saul, the ballet dancer. <laughs> but, fellas, we've had lots of letters asking for that great poet, and, well, what do you know? Here he is, it's Gabibble. <laughs> Hello, Is. Hello, Miss Langford. Gee, uh, you're beautiful. <laughs> Well, thank you, Is. Well, you know, my girl is beautiful, too, and that's why I come here. That's why you come here, huh? Yes, I have written a poem about my girl in regards to which I would like to read things. <laughs> By all means, read it. All right. My girl is exceedingly fat. I can't tell you exactly where at. But if I may, I would like to say it's between her shoes and her hat. <laughs> Thank you, Ishka Bibble. The fellas on command performance, you've often heard Joe Stafford singing with the Pied Pipers. Now, here in Hollywood, the musical masterminds are allowing us how Joe's got one of the smoothest sets of pipes in the warbling business. And confidentially, we allow us how they're right. Front and center to the international mic, Joe Stafford. Thank you, Franny. Hello to Joey Webb, the drummer boy of 953 with a sweetie down in Old Virginia. Regards to Lone Star Tex McClure and his CB buddies, to wit, Jersey, Barrel Legs, Pop the Chief, Red, Jerk, 
And, of course, in every outfit like that, there's got to be at least one sad sack. <laughs> Fellas, I'd like to whip out that tender little tune, I Love You. Stafford. Man, here's a note from Private Jerome Sheldon, 728. Dear Command Performance, I'd get a wonderful thrill if the chimes on the campus of the University of Washington at Seattle would ring 12 o'clock noon for me. Okay, Jerome, we've got those chimes waiting to peel out across Lake Washington for you. Come in, Seattle, and the University of Washington. And you're always asking about Connie Haynes. And the latest news on little Connie is doing fine on the Abbott and Costello show and singing away up in pictures. In her new flicker, Twilight on the Prairie, still before the cameras, Connie has one of the cutest numbers of the year. But she'll give you the dope on that. Fellas, Connie Haynes. Thank you, Francis Langford. And hi, fellas. Love to Yeoman Don Terry. And the same to 525 in those two ducks of the train in Santa. At 708, hello to Lonnie, Mark, Chick, and the Beantown boys. To 942, and Krebs, the mad chemist, Shorty, Muffy, and Umbriago. <laughs> At 306, love to Butch, Napper, Weasel, and the Mink. And for all of you, here's that little ditty Franny mentioned, Saltwater Cowboy. <laughs> Fine 
corazón se He's a soul, what a cowboy With the whole world for his brain Just a soul, what a cowboy And the herd he rides is strange He's a rounding up his country foe Wherever they may be Just a soul, what a cowboy A United States Marine In a bob wide corral He's the salt of the earth, boy And he's long and light and lean He's the salt water cowboy A United States Marine at 726 writes, Dear Command Performance, I've been telling the boys in Hut 11 about the wonderful voice of Yvette, and by golly, it's time we got a sample. If you all go hunting for Yvette, she's blonde, born in Louisiana, darn good-looking, and sweet and soft. I mean her voice. Please send her our way. Coming, Fred. Fellas, meet Yvette. <laughs> Thank you, Franny, and you too, Fred Wombier. Hello, Pat Duffy and the gang at Far Too Old. Hello also to Station Heliopolis in Egypt. Corporal Molnar at 9564 and the self-styled uh, Dirty Eight. Love to Beaver in the mud bug on a patrol craft. The wolf pack in Hut 79 at 944. <laughs> the black magic boys on Malta and members of the club everywhere. Here's every girl's dream over here tonight. Set to music. And our hearts sang on Was it the spell of Paris Or the London dawn Who knows when we shall meet again But when the morning chimes Ring sweet again I'll be seen in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine would trace all day through. In that small cafe, the park across the way. The children tell us the chestnut trees, the wishing well. I'll be seen in every lovely summer day, in everything that light and gay. I'll always think of you that way. I'll find you in the morning sun. And when the night is new, I'll be looking at the moon. But I'll be seeing you in every lovely sun. Summer's day In everything that's night and day I'll always think of you that way I'll 
Sergeant Francis North and the Barracks 4 mob write as follows. Writ by hand, it is, too. We want to hear Fred Lowry, the greatest whistler. And we don't mean the guy that painted his mother. Fred's the best whistler in the world, say we, even if he does come from Texas. So <laughs> tell Horace Height to let Lowry loose for a night. Well, it's command performance, Sergeant, so naturally, here's Fred Lowry. Thank you, Francis. And a special thanks, thanks to all of you guys at APO 922. So if Dick or Ron will give me a start off, I'll pucker up and blow a little Indian love call right your way. Fred Lowry. And say, what's all the furs off stage? I can see a fellow with a big brush, which is probably the janitor. No, it isn't. It's a man with a huge mustache. No, it isn't a mustache either. Those are pigtails hanging from his upper lip. <laughs> Why, fellas, it's Professor Handlebar Colonna. Handlebar Colonna, eh? <laughs> please, Francis, please. I'd rather you left my black forest out of this. No offense intended, Professor. In fact, I love your mustache. It makes me laugh. It amuses me. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. It tickles most of the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Be serious, Professor. You know, I haven't seen you since we got back from that trip to the Caribbean with Bob Hope. Where have you been the last three days? Burlesque show. <laughs> for three days? Professor, what could there possibly be in a burlesque show that could keep a man there for three days? Fresh popcorn. <laughs> Professor, you're impossible. You said what? I said you're impossible. That's possible. <laughs> In fact, sometimes it's a mystery to me how a person like you were ever born. Well, Francis, you know, I've got a confession to make. I don't like to talk about this. In fact, I never bring up the subject, but you see, I was never born. 
You were never born. Professor, if you were never born, how come you've been here for the past 35 years? Well, a guy can look around and see if he likes it first, can't he? I think you'd better sing, Professor. Ah, yes, my aunt. Fellows, you asked me to sing Sunny Boy. Sunny Boy, a sad old song that was never meant to be this sad. <laughs> When there are gray skies, I don't mind. And by the gray skies, you made them a blue, sunny boy. Friend, I may forsake me. Let them all forsake me. You'll pull me through, sunny boy. You are sent from heaven. And I know your word. You made a heaven for me right here. I and when I'm old and gray, dear, promise you won't touch such a ray, dear. I love you so, a sunny boy. When, when there are gray skies, I don't mind. I don't mind the gray skies. You made them blue. Oh, sorry, boy. Friend, friend, me for see me. Let them all, let them all for see me. You'll pull me through. Sunny boy, my lovely baby, why you're And I, I know you were. You made a heaven for me right here on earth. I'm a child. The engine. They were lonely, and they sent fiery worldly. But I follow you, say hi. The mind of a never loving sunny, sunny, sunny boy. <laughs> ah, da, 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 da. Sabotage. <laughs> Command performance thanks you again, Jerry Colonna. Well, gang, you've been awfully nice to us, writing those swell letters and dishing out all that blarney about our work. And we really eat it up because singing for somebody who sincerely wants you to is a great feeling, especially when that somebody is you. And speaking of having a feeling, that reminds me. I've had that feeling before, but never like this. But never like this Who ever dreamed this could happen To someone supposed to be smart I really must have been napping To let you walk off with my heart My dreams and I've had quite a few were never like this. This is too good to be true, but so was that.
I guess that just about takes the half hour for the count of ten. But in case you're interested, next week you'll find Old Command Performance right here where you left it tonight. Different people and different tunes, of course, but the same old desire to please the best audience in the world. Thanks, fellas, and love from all of us over here to each one of you over there. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.
Now that I look at the letter, it seems that a lot of fellows at APO 980 are hankering to hear a, a record of coming in on the wing and the prayer. Namely, the men who wanted are Sergeant Wyckowski and Privates Duckworth, Gaskabell, Hollingsworth, Harper, Turner, Garrett, and Peters. Well, men, here it is, and it's done by the old master himself, Bing Crosby. Okay, Bing, you're on. One of our planes was missing, two hours overdue.
try that one any time. But it's time to take care of some more requests. This next tune seems to be a great favorite in all areas. For instance, we got one letter asking for from Sergeant John Clark in New Guinea, and another from as far away as Alaska. That one was from Corporal De Black and Private Rex Winter with the United States Army Engineers. The number in question is Count Basie's record of the one o'clock jump. It's also been asked for by Robert Larkin and Chip's company, Law and Pep, and the Seagull crew of the Nasty Nanny. That's a hunk of request, and here comes a hunk of music. The one o'clock jump. <laughs>
that is. That is for the next 15 minutes while the Armed Forces Radio Service presents a quarter hour of uninterrupted music designed to put you at ease.
have been at ease for the past quarter hour to the music of David Rose and his orchestra. Selections heard were I Get a Kick Out of You, Our Walls, Begin the Begin, What Is This Thing Called Love, and Lover. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. From the United States to you fighting men of the United Nations, the Special Service Division of the War Department presents Downbeat. Another downbeat, and this time we got just the guy who can beat it down. The man with the torrid trumpet, Louis Armstrong, and all his lads. The songs you like to hear the way you like to hear them. And if you need any proof, just listen while Louis and his lads haul off with that swell old favorite... Coquette. Tell me, why you keep fooling little Coquette? Making fun of the one who love you. Breaking, what's that a ruling little Coquette? True heart, tenderly dreaming of you. Someday you fall in love as I fell in love with you. Maybe the one you love will just be fooling, and when you all alone with only regret, you know you'll go get love you.
Oh, that was fine, Louie, fine. Thank you, Dick Joy. It's always a pleasure to play for our fighting men overseas. Say, touring all over the country like you do, you must play for audiences of every kind. That's right, Dick. And the audience I get the biggest kick out of is watching are those jitterbugs. Well, uh, how would you describe a jitterbug, all the soldiers listening? Well, I guess they would understand me best if I'd said they're a sort of uh, human jeep. <laughs> well, I always wanted to know about jitterbugs, Louis, so let's stay on that topic and get to the root of the zoot. How can you tell a real zoot character? Or you can spot them every time by the clothes they wear. Well, how do you mean? Well, man, they don't get dressed. They get camouflaged. <laughs> <laughs> They're the fellows who twirl those big keychains, aren't they? I'd say they do, and at one dance, we had a lot of trouble with one of those guys. He kept twirling a great big keychain until we finally had to quit playing. You mean he annoyed you so much with the twirling? Well, it wasn't that he annoyed us so much. In less than half an hour, he lassoed four of our men right off the bandstand. <laughs> <laughs> the jitterbugs really dress funny at those dances, don't they? Yeah. You should see how the legs on their pants taper down. They really taper much? Much? Man, from the knees down, there are adhesive tape. <laughs> Those lads in the zoot suits must be quite a sight. Yeah, and you should have seen how they all laughed at one guy because the length of his lapel on his jacket. Why should they laugh? They all have long lapels, don't they? Yeah, but nobody else had theirs tied in a bow behind their head. <laughs> well, okay. Now, how about playing something that would make real hepcats out of all the men listening? Yes, sir. I got just the thing. Coming right up with I Got a Gal in Kalamazoo. One, two. Don't want to boast, but I know she's the toast of Kalamazoo, zoo, 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 zoo. How time fly and how she grew. I like the looks when I carry the books in the Kalamazoo, zoo, 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 zoo. I'm going to send fire, I'm going to fire, I'm leaving today. Am I dreaming? I can hear screaming. What you say, Mr. Saxmo? K-A-L-A-M-A-C-O What a gal A real pipperoo I'll make a bid for the frack of ace kid I'm hurrying to Run to Michigan to see the sweetest gal In Kalamazoo Kalamazoot. 
And now I'd like to make a little room at this microphone for a gal who sang for Louis Armstrong a little while back and who's just returned to his band because of popular demand. Ann Baker. Thank you, Dick Joy. Hiya, fellas. Well, tell me, Ann Baker, what's cooking? How come you ask me what's cooking? Well, who should know what's cooking better than a baker? Oh. <gasps> but right about here, I'm sure our fighting men overseas would like me to stop with the words and have you start with the music. Well, I'd like to sing Slender, Tender, and Tall. Is that okay, Louis? Fine. But tell me, is that how you gals really like your men? Slender, tender, and tall. Yeah, that's how we like them. But how do we get them? Shaky, shabby, and short. <laughs> okay, the music, Louis. Whenever I go to a dance You'll never see me taking a chance I get a kick cause the men that I pick Are slender, tender, and tall They come at my beck and call Give me no trouble at all I get a kick Cause the men that I pick Are slender, tender and tall The big fat daddies always tease Do everything but try to please When I put my arms round the thin one They're ready and willing to please Those kind of dates don't stall They give me no trouble at all Swell singing, Ann Baker. And now let's listen to Louie on the vocal as the band swings along with an old favorite you all know, Dear Old Southland. Oh, take me back. 
bang to zero Tennessee. Dear Old Southland, played for you by Louis Armstrong. Say, tell me, Louis Armstrong, do you remember much about the Dear Old Southland? Sure, Dick. I'll never forget when I was a kid back there. I was picking cotton one day, and I was arrested. You were arrested for picking cotton? How come? Well, seems I was picking it out of the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now, what comes next in your music book, Louis? Well, Dick... What do we always find around the dear old Southland? Well, now, let me see. Uh, Could it be a lazy river? Yes, sir. Could be.
up the lazy river. Oh, you river. You dark river. Papa Rosie, Papa Zay. Papa Zay. Papa Zay. That was swell, Louie. Thank you, Dick. You know, I'm glad you liked the song we played about that lake. The lake? But I thought that song was about a lazy river. Well, man, that just goes to show you how lazy that river was. Oh, me. Why does a great trumpet player have to become a bad comedian? You tell me. You tell me. Louie and his boys are back at work now with You Can't Get Stuff in Your Cuff. Here comes Ann Baker with a lesson in logic. So listen closely while she enumerates the various reasons why it's completely ridiculous, why it's absolutely impossible, why you just can't get stuff in your cuff. 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 Cause you got no cuff to put the stuff in. Can't get a crease in your pleat. Can't get a crease in your pleat. Can't get a crease in your pleat Cause you got no pleat to put the crease in No more suit, suit, no more reed pleat, baby No more nothing Soon there's gonna be not much meat and little mutton Can't get stuff in your cup Can't get stuff in your cup Can't get stuff in your cup Cause you got no cup to put the stuff in. Hey, George. Oh, oh George. What you want, man? Eh? Come on down here with me. I ain't I know you're a suit suit, Papa. But with me, you must agree. Can't get stuff in your cup. No? Can't get stuff in your cup. So, 